just put on a mustache. Do you get the impression that Watson is just sort of, sort of like humoring how? Yeah. This week on Backward Compatible, the roundtable discussion returns in audio form as the crew discusses their experience with Sherlock Holmes' crimes and punishments. Plus, Doc takes us through a series of two-minute mysteries. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 27. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined by Jim. Yes, I'm here. And I'm joined by Doc. Oh, hey, how's it going? Uh, Did we get an achievement for being here? <laughs> yeah, so for those of you just tuning in, well, I guess you can only just be tuning in. We were just talking about achievements. Um, maybe another topic that will come up again uh, later in this discussion. I wrote it down in the notes. It's coming and, up. And hating, them, hating achievements. So, uh, for those of you who followed Backward Compatible for a while, you might be familiar with our uh, roundtable discussions that we would do. We um, would all play a game, and then we would do an article where we would sort of go back and forth and we'd basically write a paragraph about something in the game and then respond to each other. This is scholarly, so we, we don't we didn't play the game, we experienced the game. There you go. Yeah, so no swearing, Jim. Right. <laughs> um, we, uh, right good, so. we 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 didn't we then didn't consider it a review. We still don't consider it a review per se. It's more just we played the game that we want to discuss our experience with it. Um, our experience. Scholarly experience. Um, but at this time, we decided to play um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, Crimes and Punishment, or Crimes and Punishments. Those are both plural. Yes, they are both plural. Is it both plural? Yes. Yeah, it's Sherlock Holmes, Crimes and Persan Punishments. But, okay. Unless so you look, Sherlock is not plural. Yeah, unless you look Sherlock at Holmes. the... Yeah, like Sherlock the, Holmes. The heart. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Crimes and Punishments. Crimes and Punishments. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I think the reason for that one is to avoid... Um, uh, while the title is very clearly referencing Crime and Punishment's book, um, or Crime and Punishment. By um, author Fyodor Dutkowski. Yeah, I think they want to add that wrong. Yeah, him. Yeah. <laughs> I think they want to uh, add the plurals to avoid any sort of um, uh, you know, copyright issues, any sort of licensing issues that might have arisen if they called it Crime and Punishment Sherlock sure. Holmes. Because then there'd be like... I mean, Russian people sense. are tough, but when you really like rise out of the grave... Well, he's also dead. dead. Yeah. Well, I'm sure someone still loves him. He's not that tough. His, his estate could own the rights, you know, some like, you know, random you know, movie-making company might own the rights and just haven't used it yet, or I don't know. But it, copyright's weird. <laughs> it was written in 1866. Yeah, I, think I, don't, it's under copyright. I don't think that's possible. Well, I'm pretty sure that... If not, We'll have to look this up sometime, but like pretty much everything that's worthwhile has copyright on it by someone. Um, so I would not be surprised to find out that you know that book has copyright on it. Disney has changed the laws of copyright. Yes, they have. They they, they are the ones. I'd like to see a, a Disney version of Crime and Punishment with, <laughs> Mickey, with Mickey, Mickey Mouse and singing. The, Mickey you know, Mouse and Goofy singing. and Donald Duck and singing. Great. Well, there was, was the, uh, there was the Great Mouse Detective, so maybe they can do the Great Mouse Detective Crimes sure. and Punishments. Well, that would be well, we are talking about Sherlock Holmes, the exactly. Great Mouse Detective. Yeah. It's actually a pretty good movie. <laughs> was been, it was been, a mouse version of Sherlock Holmes. It's been years since I've seen that film, but yeah, I actually remember it being pretty fun. Um, but yeah, so this is our um, our podcast edition of the Roundtable Discussion. It's probably going to be our format moving forward since we're kind of moving away from text a bit and more toward the podcast. Um, text is dead. <laughs> this is new media. So, in the spirit of Sherlock Holmes, I have prepared a little um, literary adventure for you guys. This is from, uh, it's, it's, I guess we call it a novel, but it's not really a novel. It's called Two Minute Mysteries Collection by the creator of Encyclopedia Brown. Now, do you remember Encyclopedia yes, Brown? Yes, I do. Donald Sobol was the author of Encyclopedia Brown. I only ever heard the name. I never actually read any of it. Okay. Well, Encyclopedia Brown was uh, the smartest kid in the neighborhood. And he <laughs> it. So, bless you. Excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, I just had the urge to sneeze too. Yeah. And so there must be something in the air right now. It's yeah, that's like, interesting. Allergies are getting me. Uh, mm. uh, well, Encyclopedia Brown was the smartest kid in the neighborhood, and he used to solve mysteries. Um, so this uh, is, in fact, written on an eighth grade vocabulary level. So uh, and don't feel embarrassed if you miss them. <laughs> feel deeply, deeply shamed. And what people, <laughs> what a lot of people don't really know about the Encyclopedia Brown too is that. It was actually sort of a big elaborate scheme to sell Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, the way that he could always solve his mysteries is he would use the Encyclopedia Britannica as the main reference point for all of his all of his like information. He would, You're lying. Yeah, no, I made all that up. 
It's kind of like Popeye was trying to sell spinach. <laughs> well, that's true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> they made a cartoon based on the cartoon that was on the, like, the drawing that was on the can. So. Mm. Popeye prints. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, each of these is like a page and a half long. And the idea is that it's supposed to be uh, a two-minute mystery. And the main character here is uh, Dr. Halijan. So uh, I will go ahead and read you the case of the locked room. I think I've been taken for $10,000, but I can't figure out how it was done, said Archer Skeet, the blind violinist, to Dr. Halijan, as the two friends sat in the musician's library. Last night, Marty Scopes dropped by, continued Ski. Marty had ginger ale, and we got to chatting about the locked room mysteries till I made this crazy $10,000 bet. Marty then went to the bar over there, filled a glass with six cubes of ice, and gave it to me. He took a bottle of ginger ale and left the room. I locked the door and the windows from the inside, felt to make sure that Marty's glass held only ice and put it into the wall safe behind you. Then I turned off the lights and sat down to wait. The bet was that within an hour, Marty could enter the dark, locked room, open the locked safe, take out the glass, remove the ice, pour in half a glass of ginger ale, lock the safe, and leave the room, locking it behind him, all without my hearing him. When the already now this is solved. When the alarm rang after an hour, I had heard nothing. Confidently, I unlocked the door. I kept Marty whistling in the hall when I crossed the room to the opposite wall and opened the safe. The glass was inside. By heavens, it was half filled with ginger ale and only ginger ale. I tasted it. How did he do it? Undoubtedly by means of an insulated bag, replied Halijan, after a moment's thought. There is nothing wrong with your hearing, but no man could have heard... Heard what? Ice melting. Yeah, I assume, mm -hmm. I assume the ginger ale ice was cubes. ice cubes. Ginger ale, ginger ale ice cubes. Ginger cubes. Or ice or. melting. Well done, well done. <laughs> Marty had brought with him frozen cubes of ginger ale. After setting up the bet, he had skipped... Oh, I'm sorry. He had slipped the ginger ale cubes into the glass. While they melted in the glass inside the safe, Marty waited in the hall. There you go. Okay, that was the warm-up one. <laughs> that was the easy one. I was about to say, it's like, is that, is that as bad as it gets? No, no. Oh, it gets, it gets much worse. Are we smarter than the eighth grader? Uh, so right now you're smarter than like a fourth grader. Oh, okay, great. Also, I, I loved like the... Uh, we're really put to the test here. I, I was just like cringing as I heard these things we were taught not to do in creative writing, like said so-and-so to so-and-so. <laughs> so so well, you know, you've got to establish full characterization uh, within two minutes, so, yeah, so. it's kind of tricky. The Fair. rules are meant to be broken by the true master. Well, that's so. that's right. That's yeah. what they always said Yeah. Yeah. in my rejection letters. <laughs> um, the case of the treasure map. I asked you over to settle an ugly dispute between my two sons, John Boyd, told Dr. Halijan. The affair is this. Last month, Carl and Eddie rented a luxury sailboat and cruised the Keys. On one of the islands, Carl found a piece of cloth with geographic markings. It was a map, like Captain Kidd made, on cloth drawn with dye. The map became soaked and ruined. I want you to hear each boy's story, concluded Boyd. Eddie, a youth of 20, told his story first. We lay becalmed, I like that, uh, that word, becalmed. Uh, we lay becalmed at low tide off of Break Island, he said. I was in the salon when I noticed a hole in the side, no more than six inches above the waterline. I plugged the hole with a piece of folded cloth. I didn't realize it was the map I found under the desk. I don't know how it got there. I swear, when the tide rose, the map became wet. Carl, the older brother, told a different story. Eddie was sore because I didn't immediately promise to share my treasure with him. I saw him sneak out of the salon and throw something overboard, a balled-up piece of cloth. Suspicious, I dived after it. The water was clear and calm as glass. I recovered the cloth immediately, but it was too late. On board, I saw it. The map. It was ruined. When Boyd was again alone with Legion, he said, I can't verify Eddie's story about a hole near the waterline. I simply don't know who's lying. Legion knew. 
don't think I was following that closely enough. Oh, I thought there were three brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I'm like, oh, there were three brothers here. Was, was, yeah, there, was there only two? the father okay. and the two brothers? Uh, okay. so there were three humans. There were about three four humans, humans if you include the okay. detective. Too many characters for me. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. It can be very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> Not enough characterization to that page and a half. Uh, so, so basically, one tells the story that he plugged the hole with the map they found, right? And that's how it got ruined. And the other one says, uh, "No, I watched him. He threw it overboard." Well, he could have thrown it overboard after it was already got wet, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, but that's not the story that either of them told. True. So what, is it a folded piece of cloth, or what was the thing? Yeah, it's supposedly a, a real live treasure map, which was uh, a piece of cloth with geographic markings and drawn with dye, which would make it not waterproof. Hmm. So one of, them said that, one of them said they threw it overboard? The other one threw it overboard? Yeah. Um, and they dove in after One it. said, my brother threw it overboard because he was jealous. Mm-hmm. And then the brother who allegedly threw it overboard said, no, I didn't. I was trying to patch a leak. But he said he didn't. It was supposed to be under a desk or something? Uh, yeah. He found it It was, uh, we lay becalmed at low tide off Break Island. I was in the salon when I noticed a hole in the side no more than six inches above the water line. I plugged the hole with a piece of folded cloth. I didn't realize it was the map. But they had already found the map. I'm kind of inclined to think that maybe they just like left it on the beach and then high tide came in. They just neglect. I don't know. Could be. I could be wrong. I don't know. You guys give? Sure. sure. Alright. Eddie lied. The Which sailboat. One was Eddie? Oh well Eddie was the one who <laughs> said that he's he stuck it in the hole. Okay. Yeah. But the father isn't involved in all this? Did the father do this? No, the father was trying to settle this dispute. Was he actually there? No. He was actually complicit the whole time. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, Eddie lied. The sailboat would have risen with the tide, and so the water level never would have reached the hole and wet the map. Because the hole was supposedly above the water line. So we don't really care about how it happened, just who lied. Right. Wait, so... Well, no, that tells you how it happened. I thought or they rather, were, how it didn't happen. Right. Were they, were they, they in a boat, or were they stationary? No, they were in a boat. This was in a boat. But they were in a salon. <laughs> I heard salon. They were like, they, they were getting their hair done. You know, and then they yeah, the, the salon the is coming in and they plug the You don't know your nautical terms. No. Like is this, what is a salon in nautical terms? Well, that would be the uh, the main room of the boat. Really? A salon is also the term for like the French meetings where they discuss philosophy and stuff like that. Really? That's so true. It's, yeah. it's kind of like think of it as kind of like the the meeting room. Wow. I was seriously thinking, I honestly was, I was thinking that... <laughs> they were getting more No, no. Honestly, to be honest, I actually thought that you were mispronouncing saloon, and I just didn't want to say anything. <laughs> I, was, I was going to save it, because I thought it was just going to be funny that, he, that he's mispronouncing saloon, but... Okay. So I didn't know that. As they drink their ginger ale when they uh, meet with their friends privately. Which they had brought in as ice cubes that melted. Yeah, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> salon. Okay, I never knew that. I'll forget that tomorrow. But they never did say how it was actually done. Just no. They, they, by um, they, they ruled out how it wasn't done. By exclusion, it, the other one must have been telling the truth. He just threw it overboard. Well, that's not true. And died. Must he have been telling the truth? Yeah, that's not true at all. Just well, because just because one of them we know is lying, and the other one's not. <laughs> well, that's a good point. That's, that's they're good. probably both lying. In fact, they never probably had a map in the first place. <laughs> this whole story. They all, all three are lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- there's like 300 stories. It was coming. I had to choose that one. Yes. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see here. Um, I have I have actually two more. So which one do I want to do first? Let's see here. Uh, ah, yes. This is this is the one I want to save for last. So we'll do this one instead. The case of the hotel murder. You'll like this one. There's a murder. So he's got to be murdered. Dr. H was shaving in his hotel room on the second floor when he heard a woman screaming, Help! Tossing on his robe, he dashed into the hall. In front of room 213, a woman stood crying and screaming. Introducing himself, Legion looked through the open door and saw a man slumped in an easy chair. A swift examination showed he had just been killed by a bullet through the heart. Try to get hold of yourself and tell me what happened, said the sleuth. I'm Clara Uffner, sobbed the woman. A few moments ago, I heard a knock on the door. A voice said, telegram. I opened the door, and a masked man stood there, a gun in his gloved hand. He shot my husband, tossed the gun into the room, and ran. 
The automatic pistol on the floor, Legion saw, was equipped with a silencer. Returning to the hall, he noted the door at one end marked Exit. Re-entering the room, he stepped on something hard. It turned out to be an empty cartridge shell. Further to the left was another. Both were of the caliber to match the pistol. Embedded in the wall, about two feet above the seated body, a legion discovered a second bullet. All right, Miss Upner, he said sternly. Now tell me the truth. Why did he doubt Mrs. Upner? Because it's always the spouse. In any case, it's always the spouse. Because he's sexist. No, no, it's, it's true. It's always the spouse. And that's not sexist. That's well, no, it's, it's, it's both in this case. Hmm? No, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. See, this is why I gave you the easy one first. You have a success under your belt yeah. after I threw the, the overcome. Also, the, um, I was also going to say that uh, why, did, why did he not hear the shots? Did they because silence the silencer? Yeah, but they don't work like that, especially after the first shot. <laughs> Take that. They're one. not those like high pitch like they don't do that at all. Like the whole point is to disperse the sound, right? So that you can't hear it from like you can't tell where the shot is coming from, but it's still going to make a noise. I, I okay. Okay. That is actually that's a, not what I, television that's a, movies. That's a Hollywood make. invention that like that like choo, sound that the silencers make doesn't do that. Really well, know. other people it's Hollywood it's Hollywood it just doesn't make any noise. So, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know what real time is. That's they, your answer? They do make noise. But the second one, once you fire it, it ruins the, the cartridge. That's not what anyway, and if there were two shots. So, I've, I've got more questions, actually. So, did okay. you say where the seat was situated relative to the door? Uh, he looked through the open door and saw a man slumped in an easy chair. Okay. So, that part is plausible, at least. How about that it's absurd that, that anyone would believe the story about the crazy mass man who yeah. in the door and like like shoots shoots someone and then runs off? It's ninjas. Okay. Well, ninjas have these guns. Oh yeah, I guess they don't. Oh, there's only one cartridge for two shots. There were two cartridges. Oh, well, there were two cartridges. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, didn't she say there was only one shot? Or wait, what did she say? Re-entering the room, he stepped on something hard. It turned out to be an empty cartridge shell. Further to the left was another. Both were of the caliber to match the pistol. Well, if they were in different positions, then her story doesn't make sense anyway, because he was supposed to just be at the door, right? Oh, she opened the door. Yeah, I mean, she, she stepped aside. She opened the door, yeah. So, how does that work? You would, guys are really, really would close. She, would she have been shot? Wouldn't she have been shot, too? I'm trying to picture this in my head here. She opens the door. Well, since every hotel room in the universe is laid out exactly the same. Right. <laughs> are there? Well, if she opened the door, and it's off to the left, but is that his left or her left? His left. Then yeah. As he's facing. Then yeah. If he's open, if she's opening the door, that's where she would be when she opened the door. Yeah. So she would have been shot, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Makes sense. She would have been shot if it's if it's off to the left. Assuming that's. Well, there's the there's another. Assuming I'm thinking about that. There's another detail as well, though. But you're not wrong. Okay. Well, didn't she say? How, what did she specifically say? Did she say that he shot twice or that he just shot once? Because I just remember her saying that he shot once, but. A few moments ago, I heard a knock on the door. A voice said telegram. I opened the door, and a masked man stood there, a gun in his gloved hand. He shot my husband, tossed the gun into the room, and ran. Yeah, I mean, she said that he shot him and tossed him. Didn't say, I guess he didn't technically say he didn't shoot. He just shot one. He could have been taller than her. She didn't say either, like, how wide she opened the door, because if she was sort of speaking it open, it would have been hard to toss the gun in, but she was like, oh, whoop, then she I'm assuming out. she opened the door all the way, but even if so, because the cartridges were in a different location, that doesn't make any sense. He's through that face. <laughs> yeah, but the car- like the cartridges are going to drop where she's, where, they're gonna, they would have been dropping in approximately the same place. What did you she say again the about the, the hole in the wall? Yeah, where was Embedded all? in the wall, about two feet above the seated body, the detective discovered a second bullet. It doesn't tell us which corner it is. Like if it's like you know perpendicular to the door, or if it's like right. parallel to the door. We need right. we need to do performance we of the time here. <laughs> um, you guys are about halfway there. Mm-hmm. I've already arrested her personally. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's under arrest already. Excellent. Um, do, you, do you give? Oh, I got. I think I'm right, aren't I? I mean, everything that I said makes sense. Everything you said makes sense, but there's a there's a very specific clue that immediately um, Wait, indicates. He, he stepped things. on the cartridge. He stepped on the cartridge cell when he walked in. Didn't yeah, he? when he walked back in. Okay. So the other one was outside. No. They were both inside. They were both inside. Yeah. Okay. So then, shouldn't they both been outside? 
Had the mysterious killer fired from the hall into the room, the shells from his gun would not have fallen forward into right. the room there and to the left. Yeah. An automatic pistol ejects to the right and a few feet behind yeah. the shooter. There you go. I was that detail oriented, but you know, the shells being out inside. Yeah, I didn't even really, I wasn't thinking about him stepping in until I asked. It could have been a lefty guy. Now, my, no, 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 but they still would have been outside. That's why my father in law would have gotten that one in the first couple <laughs> I didn't know about it going to a particular side. I was just thinking about it. It does make sense because like, most, be most people are right handed. If it went to the yeah. left, it would hit them in the face potentially. Mm-hmm. But. All right, the last one. The last one. This is called The Case of the Unknown Brother. Mrs. Sidney, New York's most illustrious party giver, settled back in her dinner chair. With an eccentric smile, whatever that is, she applied herself to a favorite pastime, trying to confound the deductive prowess of Dr. Legion. My childhood playmate, Jedediah Wright, ran away from home when he was 12, she began. For years, he lived by odd jobs, but in 1927, he settled in Michigan and made millions in copper. Unfortunately, Jed never married. On his deathbed, he summoned his faithful housekeeper and handed her a flat envelope containing cash, deeds, and securities. His parents had passed away a decade earlier. Jed's only living kin was a brother. Give this envelope to my brother Alf, the dying man instructed the housekeeper. The poor, distracted woman had never seen Alf in her life. Her only clue was a yellowed photograph set in a double frame with one of Jed. Unfortunately, the pictures were taken when both boys were ten, fifty-five years before. Moreover, the only clue to Alf's whereabouts was a letter postmarked the previous month from Los Angeles. The housekeeper traveled to Los Angeles and advertised the purpose of her visit. Soon, a hundred aged men were camped in outside her hotel door. Although she had never seen Alf and knew nothing about him, she was able to pick him out of the bevy of imposters. My dear Miss Sidney, to what ends will you go to stump an old sleuth? asked Dr. Legion, er, yes, Dr. Legion with a reproachful sigh. The answer is elementary. <laughs> of course. Mm-hmm. How did the housekeeper know Alf? So, okay, so the, you said this guy was like traveling until he was 12, wasn't that something about that at the very beginning? Or he was lost until he was 12 or something like that? Yes, my childhood playmate Jedediah Wright ran away from home when he was twelve. Okay, this was this was her. But, but the audience thinks yeah, of what, what <laughs> she uh, What does she? Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like, wouldn't she have known him because she knew him? Because they the picture was from when they were ten, so she would have known him, right? She would have known both brothers. Her childhood playmate ran away when he was twelve. When he was twelve, right? So she would have known both the brothers because the picture was from when they were 10? No. The thing is that um, the person telling the story, Mrs. Sidney, is not the same person as the housekeeper who was tasked with the job. So the housekeeper would not have known Jed when he was 10. Well, I mean, it's clear Miss Sidney knows the housekeeper, so she could just call up Miss Sidney. This calls to be a story she made up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably true. <laughs> um, I'm like wanting to think that there's some sort of like scar or some other mark that distinguishes them. Okay. So, um, well, are, are they, they twins, I assume? I mean, like, How do you assume that? Because they were both ten in the picture, right? Oh, good point. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> my father, everyone. Although you, also you realize way. they could have been, they, they may not have been, I mean, sometimes, identical twins, yeah. sometimes twins that are not identical can look pretty different. So. Yeah. Technically, that may not have done it, but who knows. There one, her one clue, and yours, the photograph, it was taken when both boys were 10, right, yeah. 55 years ago. Hence, Alf and Jed were twins. But after living apart for 55 years, if you're not identical twins, you can look pretty different. There is also a stretch where if they were born within a year of each other, where they would have been the same age. Also true. So, but I'm sure they're not thinking that technically. Write a letter to Donald Sobol, <laughs> debunking the four stories that I have told. You. <laughs> um, uh, but all of that was just simply lead in to get us in the mood for 
uh, what we're actually talking about today, which is uh, the Crimes and Punishments Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Which I think it's actually Sherlock Holmes colon Crimes and Punishments. It's just the logo reverses it for some reason. Yeah. So if you look on the box, it actually it says Crimes and Punishments Sherlock Holmes, which is actually, it led me to think at first that maybe Crimes and Punishments was like some other series of mystery games that they were like doing their Sherlock Holmes spinoff. I think it's Crimes and Punishments colon Sherlock Holmes parentheses reverse it. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. Is that it? But like okay. any, anywhere you see the actual title, though, it's Sherlock Holmes: Crimes and Punishments. Um, because it's from I, a series. Yeah, it's from a series. Right. It's from these guys have done Sherlock Holmes. Frog, is it Frogware? It's Frogware. Frogware. Also, Frogware. Also, Frogware. Also, like, like yeah. Also, plural. wait, is it with a Z? No, it's not. Oh. Uh, is Focus Interactive the publisher? Yeah, yeah. Focus Home Interactive is the publisher, mm-hmm. and it's on uh, Windows, PS3, PS4, Xbox 360, and Xbox One. Came out in 2014. So there we go. We cited our source. We can continue with yes. that scholarly. And uh, it is Xbox One, even though it's the third Xbox. That, that drives me nuts, because I, really I we got into this thing where we were trying to set up an event, and uh, they were saying, oh, yeah, we have an Xbox One. It's like, so is that an Xbox One, or is that Xbox One? You're supposed to call that Xbox Classic. Yeah. I just call it the X-Bone. The X-Bone, X-B-O-N-E. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, I've kind of been calling it the X-Bone, yeah. Or you call it Xbox Classic, that's a good one too. That's for the or, original. Or, or simply just Xbox. Or Xbox original. But you can't just say Xbox. Yeah, yeah because someone will assume that you just mean like, oh, any given Xbox. Yeah. Exactly. Well, X means 10, so really it's the 10 box, and it mm-hmm. always has been. The 10 box one. Yeah. Actually, what I think is the laziest is actually sound for constantly just naming all their systems a number. It keeps it simple. No, but that's just lazy. Well, it's. It's categorized. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you consider that a three, box but is a four. square, mm-hmm. and you've got an X and yeah. a square and O for one, and they're actually doing major copyright infringement upon PS3. Yeah. They should sue. <laughs> yeah, I think I can say that. Yeah, because it's, it's actually X square circle. I'd actually, I'd actually like to see that. Because, they're missing uh, the Microsoft trigger. has significantly more money than Sony, so it would be a very funny lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> they would not win. <laughs> They would not win that case. Well, we wouldn't know who to root for. Exactly. You see, this no. is the, thing is, the thing is, like with Nintendo, and this is getting us way off track, so I'll just finish with this. Right oh, okay. Here. The thing with the Nintendo is, like, each of their consoles is named something different. So, like, there was NES and there was Super Nintendo. So, okay, sequential, but then they switched up to other. But it also wasn't just a number. It wasn't like NES two. Yeah. They just said Super. Yeah. yeah. There's something to that. Plus, it was. And there's Wii. It was the Wii. early '90s. Everything yeah. was super extreme. Yeah. Yeah. So it was great. Extreme. Yeah. yeah. Then we have N64. You're like, okay, '64. Yeah. yeah. It was just the in part because that's extreme too. And '64. Yeah, 64 is actually derived from some mathematical formula. It's like a key to doing 3D anything. I forget exactly what it is. Well, it's just 64 bits, right? No, it wasn't 64 bit. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Well, it might, it might have been, but it might have been 64 bits because, like, I forget exactly what it was, but there's some thing where, like, if you cube a certain number, like, and do some other stuff to it, it ends up being 64. I think that's where they got it from. But well, anyway. we're getting way off track. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But the uh, the Xbox, um, it's just like you never know where they're going to go next because it was Xbox and 360, and now it's back to one. So it would be Xbox Two. Xbox Two. I actually kind of hope they just call it the Y box next time, just throw people off. Nice. The, the Y box. And then that way, when people are talking about it, they can just, you know, why? I want to get the Y box. Why not? <laughs> why? Why not? <laughs> That's their slogan. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> the Y box. Sony why slogan not? right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sony's just going to call it PS5 and the PS6, and eventually they'll go out of business. And this appeals to me, so I'm good with this. <laughs> well, they have to eventually get to the, uh, what is it, the, the PlayStation 23 that they did in that ad back in the 90s? Right? I don't even think it was that many ahead, was it? I it was like. 14, maybe seven, or eight, I don't know. something like that. It was but cool. it was the, it was the, basically it was augmented reality. Yeah, which is essentially what we're gonna have in the next version. Yeah. So it just occurred to me that like they could have had PlayStation 3 version like 1.4 or 0.14 something like that. Yeah, and it could have been PlayStation Pi. They could have done a re-release oh, instead wow. of doing PlayStation yeah. Slim. It's PlayStation Pi. They're never gonna do that because they're not creative. They just want to call <laughs> it, and then something like Slim. Besides, like, that's wow. PSP. So yeah. yeah. So Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess uh, we'll go ahead and start by asking um, what platforms you guys play the games on, or play the game on, and uh, kind of just initial impressions. Well, I played it on Xbox 360 because my uh, PC is starting to become a paperweight. Uh, I haven't need to update it, so I was unable to play the game on my PC, I found out. So I got it on Xbox 360, and it worked fine, aside from really horrible loading times on certain sections. Mm-hmm. But I guess we'll get to that later, particularly... The, uh, the plant chapter, the plant case. Really? Every time I would open one of those greenhouses, I'd be sitting there for like, it felt like eternity. It was probably 10 seconds, but it felt <laughs> like an eternity. 
the dock with the <laughs> processors and everything? Man, that's on insane. the Xbox 360. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I played it on uh, PS3. Mm -hmm. I didn't have such loading problems because it's a superior platform. It <laughs> probably is. I, uh, I wouldn't even argue that. Which is funny because it's off, often the reverse. If you develop for Xbox and ports, PS3 often the loading times get worse. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Well, I mean, this was made with uh, what was it like Unity three? It's Unreal. Unreal three. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I don't know. But uh, I didn't actually pay for it because I have a PS Plus and it was a free game a couple of months ago. And so the, the case of the stolen game. Yeah, yeah, it, and so it's kind of nice. Uh, I've been enjoying lots of uh, so-called free games for the price of one. I uh, also played it on PS3. I took advantage of that same deal. Um, you told me about it. it. Sounded interesting, so I grabbed it uh, before the month was up. Um, I did technically have to pay for it. I basically renewed my PlayStation Plus subscription long enough to get it. Um, oh, that makes sense. Because, I mean, I, I usually do keep up to date with it. I have not played enough PlayStation. Apparently, uh, I had a few months there where my subscription for the year had expired. I hadn't renewed it because I had been around to notice it. Right. Um, so I did get on PS3. I probably would have preferred it on PS4. The graphics probably would have been better, better frame rate, better loading times. But um, aside from... Uh, we'll get into this or later, PC. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, sure I'm sure if you have a great PC, that's the system to play on, especially since it is yeah, essentially a point-and-click adventure yeah, yeah. with using a controller, mm -hmm. which did work surprisingly well, except for the, um, the, the part where you're trying to examine the person, mm -hmm. and you have to click on the different... And just doing that with the controller felt very slow and antiquated. Yeah, you know, when you're trying, to, like, you're trying to like size them up and look at the clues in their body to see what kind of person they are and build their profile. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one of those, um, <clears throat> I'm not the PC gamer master race. Uh, I've been tainted by consoles for many generations. Consoles will be in? Yes. So uh, even when I'm playing on the PC, I still find myself using the Xbox controller. So uh, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that is yeah, graceful. <laughs> graceful. Hey, I'll take it. You know. I, I honestly think it depends <laughs> on the genre. No, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> just kidding. But it, no. I, it, completely it, does, it completely does depend on the genre. Now, if you're playing something like Civilization and you're trying to plug in your Xbox controller... That I do play with. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, at the same time, though, a lot of shooters, which people say you have to play mouse and keyboard... Well, you do if you want to be good. Yeah. Well, I don't care that okay. much about being good. That's fine. And that's why I play co-op games and single-player <laughs> games, so I don't have to worry about 360 no-scoping okay. people. To so. be player, fair, I, remember <laughs> I played all of Wolfenstein New Order with my controller, because mm -hmm. I had no choice. I can't like, put on my PC now, so... And I, and I still had a great time and loved the game, mm -hmm. so... There you go. Um, okay, so uh, for those who have not played it, the majority of the game involves exploring crime scenes, examining clues. Uh, I like to call this um, L.A. Noir as it should have ended. Yeah, I mean it's 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 an adventure game. It's a point and click. It's a modern style point and click adventure game, which is a genre that sort of was very popular back in the um, early '90s mm -hmm. because that was kind of all that we could do in terms of. At least in terms of like the ease of, of doing high-level graphics and also pushing audio content, that was really the best um, the best genre for that. Uh, because you, know, you had the PC, you had the, you had the sound cards for new, and you were able to push graphics that you did on something like in a fully 3D environment, like say you would get on um, you know, Doom. You couldn't have the same level of graphics because of the way that the uh, the world was set up. So I think that was one of the reasons why they were so they were so big, and then of course later on, once everybody else kind of caught up, the genre really didn't really evolve much. And nowadays we have sort of like the twists on them with the Telltale game mm -hmm. and and Sherlock Holmes, which I think is actually a lot closer to an old style adventure game than the Telltale games, which tend to be more focused on yeah, no, narrative. There's a lot less actual adventure element in like puzzle solving. The last Telltale game that I played that reminded me a lot of old school adventure was actually um, Strong Bad's Cool Game for Attractive People. Um, because it's like you move around the environment, you pick up stuff, you use stuff to get through problems um, or to solve problems. Whereas with the Telltale, like what we think of now as Telltale, it's more of like a you know, cinematic experience with occasional exploration, that sort of thing. Well, you but, have narrative choices, mm -hmm. but you don't really, there's not really too many puzzles. There's right. a few that can sort of arguably be considered puzzles. Mm -hmm. But back to Sherlock Holmes, it's, it's full of puzzles. It's got a whole bunch of little different different little mini, mini games mini and, games, and yeah. mini puzzles. And um, depending on what you want to call it, I, I think you can group them all into like different categories. Mm -hmm. and I definitely see the comparison to old school adventure games and actually what intrigued me about it was that maybe I just didn't play enough mm -hmm. mystery games back in the day, but it seems to me that like a lot of times these mystery games, you just sort of play through them and you play it like a normal adventure game and then by the end, essentially, you were just automatically figure out what the 
you know, who done it, essentially. You know, it just sort of tells you more or less what the thing was. So the mystery, not really, seems to be. Well, maybe they got you guys in play. Have you played Broken Sword? No. Okay, Broken Sword is a. Se- have you played Broken Sword? Fuck. It's a series of, of, of adventure games that are um, pretty highly regarded, mm-hmm. I would say, mm-hmm. that are all uh, mysteries. And the general yeah. idea is that you play as. And so they recently they've been reintroduced as uh, with you know better graphic quality. But uh, each of the Broken Swords has a different mystery, mm-hmm. and usually you play as um, two different characters. I know the first one you play as two different characters. One of them is a, I think they're, are they both reporters? I think my, one's a reporter, and then one like witnesses witness the event or something like that. Anyway, the point is that there's some sort of a mystery that you see take place. There's like a murder at the beginning of the first one, for example. And one person witnesses it, but you're trying to figure out why it happened and who actually it was because the person's in disguise. And the whole thing is all about solving the mystery. And as you get deeper, there's like layers of the mystery. Mm-hmm. So you sort of like peel back the layers. It's like it's like you're reading a detective novel and you think you find someone that is the you know the guilty part, and it's like, well, no, there's a little more to it. Mm-hmm. Or oh, I thought it was him. Oh, now he's dead. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't really him, mm-hmm. or it was, but there was more to it. Well, you see that, that that that's kind of what I'm talking about, though. Where like basically you just sort of go through the story, and by the end you figured it out. Well, you have to figure it out yourself. Yeah, I mean, you, do, you, do have to, you do have to think. That's the whole point. That, that is an element. An adventure game is a fundamentally linear game, though. And, right, correct. And the neat thing about this one, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk about this in a full episode, <laughs> is because of that um, deduction board. Yeah, that's what I was trying yeah. to get to. Yeah. yeah, it's so different. So somebody, somebody described you, you know what? Well, how okay, that works. So what I would say, because I do want to point this out, that I think it's very similar to in, or it's a sort of a reimagining of an old adventure game, what you would do is you would, you would have a lot of inventory management, mm-hmm. and you would have to combine a lot of your different inventory into new pieces that you could then use to solve puzzles. Mm-hmm. And to me, I really, and I don't know if it's true, but I think that somewhere when they were brainstorming ideas for this game, someone was thinking about old inventory systems and the way that you would combine different inventory pieces mm-hmm. to make new inventory pieces that could then be used to solve puzzles and thought, what if we can do that with clues, mm-hmm. because that's what it felt like to me. You mm-hmm. would get clues, yeah. which were essentially your inventory to solve a case, mm-hmm. and you would take those clues and you would combine them in different ways in order to get, in order to form deductions, and mm-hmm. then you would take those deductions and you would combine those in different ways in order to get conclusions, or additional deductions and then get conclusions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, essentially it's like a um, a collection of thoughts when you go into your, your deduction space, mm-hmm. and you see all your, your little clues, and they, if you click on them, you give you a Additional readout of more you know, specifics about each clue, and then you're you're supposed to combine uh, two clues together. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they kind of missed out where you can't combine multiple, but I guess that would have been a little bit more complicated. I think this is kind of like a test run or something. Possibly. 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 Some of them you can use more than one stuff. True. Yeah. That's so. true. Um, but yeah, so you combine them together. I also didn't like how you could technically just trial and error. It. Yeah. I didn't really like that. That's true. Um, but but anyway, that's not a good idea. It, it was a very interesting system, and I can understand why they didn't necessarily mm-hmm. want to. That's another thing we can actually talk about is sort of the, the, the way they sort of balance um, the difficulty mm-hmm. or, or lack thereof. Um, and so you go into the uh, conclusion space after you after you put the I'm sorry the deduction space after you combine your clues, mm-hmm. and it's sort of this uh, this sort of web of different uh, deductions. Mm-hmm. And eventually, mo- many of them have choices that you can make yeah, between you, one or the other. The way you interpret it. So and it's each deduction. Yeah, usually when you get a new deduction, it's just kind of like, here's the deduction I've made, but as you get more information, you can start to interpret it differently. Yes. Um, and often it comes down to, like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Well, one of them was, for, I know in the um, the last case, I believe it was, in warning, there will be spoilers all throughout here. Yeah. But um, <laughs> in the last case, there was, you, um, Leighton, Leighton was the guy who, who Sort of was the initial initial person the police caught the red herring it was clearly not guilty because that was the whole point of it was to prove his innocence. Um, it was oh the person that he saw was just like an in- invention of his like maddened mind mm-hmm. because he was so distraught over what he had done mm-hmm. and that was the first thing the first you know deduction that you were able to make before you get enough clues. Later as you start to get more clues. Um, you're able to form them together in such a way that you can now make a choice. Yeah, so you, you choose was it a figment of his imagination or right. was it an actual suspect? Or was it an suspect? actual suspect, yeah. which, um, you, and given what you've seen so far, it makes more sense yeah. to pick that, but you don't have to. You mm-hmm. can sort of, you can piece together the evidence, um, or rather, you can piece together the clues. I guess it's, it's not really true that you can piece together the clues any way you want, it's more like you can piece together your, you can interpret the clues yes. any way you, or mm-hmm. you want, and then piece mm-hmm. the deductions together based on that interpretation. Yeah. And then what got really cool was when you'd have deductions that were um, logically they couldn't 
both exist. They are mutually exclusive. Right. You would get like this little thing where it would turn red instead of blue, saying, "Hey, this doesn't work right now." Mm -hmm. But so what you do is you sort of you can futz with it a little bit. Uh, if you want to sort of trial and error, you can. Otherwise, just kind of thinking through it yourself. Um, once if you have enough things that are blue, they'll all connect together and form this new node, which says, "Oh, this is a possibility for either a new deduction or for a conclusion you can draw about." Mm -hmm. It was you know. Um, Colonel Mustard and the ballroom with the candlestick. That's a spoiler for case three. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, and then, but then you can have you can have different takes on each of the deductions, and that forms a different, totally different conclusion. And so, it's actually possible to say find two out of three possible conclusions, mm -hmm. or you know, two out of the four, or to find all of them and just have to decide which conclusion that you think it is. And I really like how deductions would open up new thing, like new investigations that you could do into the yeah. case. Like I know I believe it was the first case where you're practicing with the harpoon on the pigs. Yeah, mm -hmm. the first case. And you're able to open that up based on your deduction. Mm -hmm. Or um, you're you're able to investigate the circus because you put together enough deductions to realize, oh, it could have been, you know, a circus acrobatic on this wall. Mm -hmm. So things like that which which make perfect sense in the world of Sherlock Holmes. So yeah. you wouldn't necessarily jump to that. Um, Doc, you have thoughts on this? Well, I, I really liked the way that you had lots of different tools. Um, just jumping back to L.A. Noir for a second. Mm -hmm. um, L.A. Noir was about exploring the space until the little jingle happened, and I knew I was close to a clue, mm -hmm. and then moving my cursor around until I found it and picked it up. And when the music stops, you know you found everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you could turn that off, but yeah. Well, but it was very samey. Yeah. And just about the point where I thought that Sherlock Holmes was going to get samey, it mixed it up a little bit, and it, it threw in a mini game, or I had to go into Sherlock Vision, or I had to use his imagination mm -hmm. as a tool, um, or I had to, to and, build and recreate something, and it just became really interesting. And let's stop right there real quick and sort of explain what these two are. Mm -hmm. the Sherlock, you want to explain the Sherlock Vision and the imagination? Well, you know, it's funny, it actually reminded me to, uh, of Arkham, of the Batman That's series, a good point, yeah. more than anything else, except you're not fighting. Um, it's just a certain way that you you can spot, I don't know, like blood stains or something. Mm -hmm. um, the example I really liked in the first case was he looks at the bookshelf and sees that there's a spot that doesn't have dust. Yeah. And then he'll say, oh, okay, I see that there's no dust. Other people would overlook this, but and it actually has in the style of the BBC show, if you've ever seen that, um, BBC Sherlock, where the text pops up. Mm -hmm. um, so he looks at the dust and you see the text pop up saying, like, okay, spot in the dust where it's not there, approximately the size of you know, whatever. It must be a you know, lockbox that was there and I was missing. Right. Um, and so now you know to be looking for a missing lockbox because it's something that Sherlock knows. Yeah. It does a good job of kind of walking you through this, this thought process, too, and getting you into his mindset mm -hmm. through things like that. But I, I got to make a very strong point here, and it's that this is not a linear game. Um, old adventures, even even like if you go all the way back to like text adventures and things like that, a lot of them were just written to be very linear. Even if they were um, in the room you're in, you've got to solve all the things there before you can move on. It's gated, which is a little bit of gating that goes on in this game. But um, you can actually move on to new sections and new areas without having talked to a specific person about a specific thing mm -hmm. to unlock. It. And and that's what I really liked about it is that. I wasn't sure, even if, until the very last sort of moment of the first case, so we'll call it a sixth of the way through the game, mm -hmm. probably not content-wise, but at least experience-wise, um, I didn't know if I liked the game still. Mm -hmm. and, and that was from a, from a scholarly perspective. I, I made the decision that I liked the game because that moment came up, and I actually took a screenshot of it and, and, and texted it to Chris yeah. and said, now I'm into this game because it told me how many clues uh, I had, made, you know, gotten, and out of the total that I could have gotten, mm -hmm. it told me the um, conclusion that I had chosen based on the uh, available conclusions that were there, and then I had the option of deciding whether or not to reveal if I was right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was going to allow me to continue on and be wrong. The fact that you can get through the entire game and be wrong every single time uh -huh. is really appealing to me from a mystery game's perspective because yes. I don't feel like I, I don't. If you're playing a mystery game right, you really want to be a mystery. I don't think you should feel like you know you were right by the end of it, um, um, which is. Um, like, you know, and I checked myself the first couple of cases because I still wanted to see how the game was working and that sort of thing. Um, but 
you know, after that, you just sort of let it go. That's your excuse and you're sticking to it. It's like, I gotta see if this is working. Oh, no, I actually, I was, I was curious. I just want to see, like, how it worked. Because I got it wrong. I'm kidding. The, I got it wrong the first time. In the first case, I was kind of torn between two, so I picked one. Mm-hmm. And then I went through and chose my second one. It turned out the second one was right. Did you Did you redo to look for a different ending? Um, I just went back. So what you can do is you say if you're not satisfied with that choice, you just go back to before you made the choice. Right. So it's not like you have to do the entire case. Over. Right, yeah. I, I was asking if you did actually mm-hmm. redo it, or did you just continue on? I I did go back and change it the first time because I wanted to compare, like, you know, what the wrong one looks like versus the mm-hmm. right one. Um, and then once I knew that, did mess. you did you implicate the wrong person, or did you do something that you didn't like in terms of the final group? I implicated the wrong person the first time because again I was torn, and so the first time I was going, okay, I'll check it just to sort of see how everything works, and then the second time I got it right, and then from then on I just checked it the end of the game. It seems to me like there's a couple ways you can play this game. The first, of course, would be to come in and try to solve all the mysteries and get all the answers right. Uh, second would simply be to try to find all the clues and then come up with an answer. That's kind of what I did. I made sure I found every clue before I made the deduction, even when I was, even when I could have technically maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's actually true. I think you have to find all the clues before you can make the right to the right conclusion. Or maybe I should go back and check that. But it seems like if you miss clues, you're and maybe that's not true. I don't think you always need all the clues no. to make the right to make the right choice. No, because no, it, it will tell you if you have all the clues. And right. there were a couple times when I got the right choice without having. I never moved on without getting all the clues. I felt like mm-hmm. I couldn't do it. Yeah, me too. I just felt like there. Yeah, I missed something here. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna keep going. Yeah. I, I feel like that's what Sherlock Holmes would do as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that if, if he felt, because I'm assuming as well, when when, when you're inside your deduction space, you're mm-hmm. essentially in Sherlock's brain. Yeah. So I'm assuming that he's saying that there's no clues left because he believes that there's no clues mm-hmm. left. But if he's not saying that, then he must believe there's no clues out there, therefore he would look for those clues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's why I, I, I felt obligated um, in this as Sherlock Holmes. Which, by the way, brings up something else as we're going through this, and maybe this falls into character more than story. Mm-hmm. But did you did y'all play as third person or in first person mode? Because I had to play in first person mode. I did person. mostly third person. Really? Yeah. I did mostly first person. Yeah. Yeah, I did. It actually had to do with camera bobbing and feeling a little bit uh, that that too queasy. <laughs> but I also felt like um, for the way that the game was set up for me, um, it felt more like I'm exploring space if it's first person. Mm-hmm. Whereas Sherlock kind of got in the way when I wasn't. It felt mm-hmm. like I'm I'm kind of like I'm Yoda riding on Sherlock's back mm-hmm. trying to solve cases. Right. <laughs> uh, and yeah. It just it felt a little it felt wrong. So uh, and especially when I'm I'm hearing his voice, it felt more like I'm Sherlock. I'm solving these cases. I'm making these points. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of prefer to play that way. Chris, why do you think, why, why did you play as third person? Um, part of it is just because I didn't like the camera bob in the first person mode when I was walking and like having seen the third person, I saw that the bob was like one, two, one, two, and the bobbing in the first person was like one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Um, that just kind of bugged me a little bit. I like to see my characters and interacting with stuff, so that's just a personal preference. It wasn't because I felt more or less, um, uh, what's the wrong word? Like I had more or less agency, or more or less like I was um, immersed. It's just I prefer to do the same thing in Skyrim. Richard's not here to get um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I actually went back and forth in Skyrim. Did you? Yeah. Um, and part of that was just because sometimes it's easier to see things in aim um, in first person mode. Yeah. Um, but in third person, you know, of course, you can see the action. And that's kind of cool. Yeah, you're so. playing a, a ranged character. So. Well, mm-hmm. in in Skyrim, um, you can do first person, but then when you get those like bonus special like it goes, it goes to third person anyway mm-hmm. so you never really miss those yeah. so i always play in first person I, I i take a chance to look at my character and go oh yeah i look kind of cool now mm-hmm. and then go back to first person sure um yeah. just kind of prefer what i play and i haven't played i haven't replayed grand theft auto 5 because my computer can't play it on my pc to see if the first person mode if i actually would prefer it because mm-hmm. i'm so used to playing gta oh, as third person yeah. but i never really thought of doing that but maybe i would mm-hmm. i don't know that's an interesting because i actually do really enjoy playing through a lot of these games in the first person because I do feel that it does increase immersion. Mm-hmm. Maybe that would actually take me out of the team if they would be able to play it mm-hmm. in first person. So how did you feel about those moments whenever it popped us out of Sherlock and into, say, Watson or um, one of the officers? Then I had, then I played third person, yeah, on the. Did you? Oh, every time. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Every time. Because I, 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 I was not, I'm not Watson. I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 what's his name? Like Mara, I think it was, mm-hmm. the cop? Yeah. So I felt, okay, I'm just, I'm Sherlock watching him or, you know, visualizing what mm-hmm. he might be doing. Searching for yourself in an hour. Yeah. And he's behind you the whole time. Oh, right. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think that that was a part of it. I mean, speaking of the characters, because you, you mentioned, um, I, know, I know Sherlock, I think that they did Sherlock 
very well, personally, um, in terms yeah. of the, the characterization of Sherlock. Um, and Watson, Watson too, I thought they had a good sort of like relationship, and I think it came through. Um, at least, you know, about as accurately as you're going to get. And Watson, I guess, could have been used more, I would say, mm-hmm. is the only thing that it felt like in some cases he was completely absent. Yeah. And then when he was there, a lot of it was he was just sort of there in a crowd and he would just kind of stand there. And he would help you sometimes, but um, I always re- I always remember him. It's been a long time since I read any of the Sherlock um, stories. But I always remembered Watson being more... Like, interact, like interacting with Sherlock more. Part of that's just the, the tense of the way those are told, because they're told from his perspective. That's true. So, yeah. Yeah. He did make reference to writing his cases as stories and right. stuff like that. Which I thought was mean. very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you think it compares to some of the other entries, the Sherlock entries? Like, um, other yeah, we could, yeah, we could point to the, the modern BBC right, Sherlock, the, 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 you know, which I like, and Cumber, Cumberbatch. Or Cumberbatch, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I, I like. I mean, I like um, a lot of the different interpretations of Sherlock Holmes, but I think this one has a more accurate feel. It, well, the setting was right. The setting was right, but also the way the characters are presented, the way it's very, it comes across as a, as a strong and accurate adaptation, whereas. You know, the BBC isn't just, we're taking these characters and we're putting them in modern times, we're modernizing these characters, mm-hmm. and you really get that sense. So it works for what it is, but it also feels feels different, which in some way is a good thing. Um, the Guy Ritchie mm-hmm. uh, film with Robert Downey Jr., which we talked about before we started recording, mm-hmm. is another example of, of arguably not even sure, like Sherlock in name only in a way, mm-hmm. because it's very different from the books, but it's entertaining in its own way, yeah. as an adaptation of that story in a very, um, a very abstract adaptation. Mm-hmm. What are some of the other uh, more recent ones? Um, there's Elementary, which I've never seen. Oh, right, yeah, I saw a few episodes of that. It is not good. Where Watson is female? Lucy Liu. Watson is Lucy Liu. Lucy Liu? Not, not just okay. female, Lucy Liu. Oh, that's which funny. She does okay, actually. I, the few episodes that I saw, they focus a lot on his um, opium addiction. Yeah. So it's like a really huge point of, of the story. But I think the biggest problem with Elementary is that um, it's really a mediocre to above average at best show in that came out at the same time as the BBC Sherlock, which mm-hmm. is just clearly better written. Mm-hmm. So it just and it has better characters and you know the cinematography is better. I mean, just everything about it is just better, uh, makes it a better show. Right. So it's really hard to compete. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why you would watch Elementary unless you're just really in love with the idea of Lucy Liu being Watson, which actually does work, I'll admit. It, but if you're just like one of those, like, I can't get enough Sherlock, everything Sherlock I'm going to consume. The guy that they have that plays Sherlock in Elementary, I can't forget his name. Um, he's okay. He does a pretty nice job. That's probably not a good sign. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm really bad with names. Oh, so. okay. Fair enough. I, just, I only know Guy Ritchie because I looked him up before. Oh, yeah. I'd probably forget Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. if he wasn't all over the place. So. Well, what, what do you think about his interpretation? Okay. Oh, um, I mean, it fit perfectly with the Guy Ritchie like style of storytelling, yeah. but I don't think that it was ac- I don't think that it was a good. I don't think it was a, it was an accurate adaptation of Sherlock mm-hmm. per se. But I think that Guy Ritchie has a very particular style, and within his 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 world and the way that he portrays characters, you have to have that sort of that more larger than life kind of quirky. Like everyone is kind of gay in Guy Ritchie's world. Like I don't. I mean, it's just that's how it is, and it just kind of works. Like yeah. if you're, even if you're a really, really tough gangster, you're also kind of gay. Or I guess it's like a gay maybe somewhere like can't can't be. You're can't be. Like everyone's okay. kind of can't be in Guy Ritchie. I don't know if you've seen a lot of Guy Ritchie movies, like yeah. Snatch, yeah. Uh, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. So yeah, he he has this. You know what I'm talking about then, right? Like yeah, all these characters are kind of like like can't be, or you know, at that sort of level where you're. Um, everyone's kind of fabulous in their own way. They like so, a little quirk. Yeah, and so it, it, it works, and, it, and I actually really like that style. I think mm-hmm. it actually, I, I'm actually also a fan of camp. Emily Gardner is what I would call it. There we go. There we go. We can, we can use that term too. Yeah. <laughs> so, something I wanted to ask you guys about this kind of ties back into the talk we're having earlier about the conclusions you can draw on. You know, for instance, you can um, accuse the wrong person, or you can accuse the right person by the wrong method. But the other thing you can do is choose whether you want to. Um, punish them, or if you want to absolve them, this is tying into and, and, and it's um, condemned too. Because yeah. you always are punishing condemned. them in a way, technically. Yeah, um, it's always something that you're doing. Yeah, but it, it comes back to like the, the themes, like you know, in the title, of course, it's referring to crime and punishment, um, and they have the themes of crime and punishment of like you know the 
sort of the burdened law bringer who has to decide, like, you know, am I going to follow justice strictly, or, you know, am I, is my human side going to kind of come through and, like, you know, show some mercy on these people or be a little more understanding, absolve them, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, so what do you guys think of the idea that with any given case, you could sort of say, for instance, um, punish them, it was murder, and it's wrong, or it's like, oh, it was self-defense, so we'll show some leniency, something like that. Okay, well, I'll pull out my humanities degree here, and... Um, <laughs> Drop the book. Say, yeah. <laughs> Throw the book at. Um, I'll say that Sherlock is argued to be an amoral character, mm-hmm. uh, and every interpretation has some kind of take on that. Um, for example, um, the, the the cover bash version. Mm-hmm. He's actually kind of a prick, and that's sort of the modern interpretation. Is and kind of antisocial, and I. I've got the uh, I've got the Asperger's gene, and so I'm you know I'm super smart, but I'm also this prick. And it's like, no, <laughs> um, that's not who Sherlock was, and, and you know that's that's not the Sherlock that I read whenever I read that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's not necessarily a bad thing to have kid. a different character in an adaptation. No, 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 and, I, and that's fine. But, mm-hmm. but what I'm saying is, I think that that was faithfully translated over into this video. Game, right. Is that idea that um, he wasn't. He wasn't bad. He wasn't good. He was objective. He was truly objective. And because of his objectivity, he was able to look at situations and say, um, yes, this person committed a, a, a murder, and here's the reason why they did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, as opposed to getting entangled into the emotions of it, right? the apparent emotions of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of cool. Uh, he wasn't, I, w- I don't want to say he wasn't dysfunctional. I almost said he wasn't dysfunctional, because he kind of was dysfunctional, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but he wasn't. Um, he wasn't crippled by his dysfunction, mm-hmm. put it that way. I do, I mean, I do, I don't know if I would really go so far as say he was immoral or amoral. Um, I amoral think, like immoral. Yeah. Right, but I don't think he was amoral either. I do think that he did have amoral code. I do think that he felt obligated to solve a case. That's part, of, that's part of the morality of it, too. I don't think he was just about the puzzle, mm-hmm. per se. Which, by the way, we didn't talk about House as a Sherlock Holmes adaptation. <laughs> yeah. Which is that? That's actually a good one. This I will say. But it's a definitely an adaptation. Yes. But um, I do think that he did have a sense of um, morality. I think that, in a, in a sense, is sort of interpreted in those Indians as well when you're doing these alter bit. Mm-hmm. Because with either one that you do, he makes a case for why he's doing it, mm-hmm. and I do right. think there's a moral implication for either way. Well, because I, I actually did, some of them I did absolve, some I did um, convict. Or, um, but that was you. Yes. And you just did it to be a cheat, right? No. <laughs> no, I did it, I did it for my, my own choice. But, but, but I know how much you love it. Right. <laughs> we'll get to those later. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, the absolve and the, and the convict part um, that I'm talking about now, it's like either one. Like when I did the absolve, I felt like, I personally felt there was a, re- like there was a reason for it. But Sherlock, he gives an explanation that comes across as a very moral reason for why he's doing it. Yeah, but he does that in every ending. I know, but that's my point. He's not presented as immoral, a- amoral at all. But isn't that in every single true? choice? No, in every single um, being, being having morality doesn't mean you have consistent morality. I don't think anyone has consistent morality. I think we think that we do. Oh. <laughs> but I think that I think that Sherlock, I think it, that we convince ourselves that what we're doing is we're doing it. We're doing what's right for what we think is the right reason. Mm-hmm. And I think that Sherlock, to me, comes across as doing that on every single choice. Interesting. Every single one, whether he's convicting or he's absolving, he's saying why he's doing it. Like, for example, in the train case, which technically neither, that's either absolve or conflict. It's like political reasons. Yeah. Or yeah, it's true. The other one was go after them right away. Mm-hmm. And I did the go after them right away, and there was a reason for it. He was saying, oh, well, if I don't go after them right now, they might get away. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's this, like, element of, I have to make sure that like, what's most important is that these people are punished for their crimes. That's a moral decision. Mm-hmm. Or the other the other way is, oh well, what about all the political implications? What if this leads to like, you know, trade sanctions mm-hmm. with Mexico and war? I think so. Yeah. There's this there's this element too. Mm-hmm. Like like yes, there's this element of, of comparing the pros and cons in a very logical way. Mm-hmm. But there's still a, a moral aspect to it. Otherwise, if you're if you're looking at it as a completely immoral decision, then neither of those two cases should really mm-hmm. Like, it really shouldn't be almost any weight to either one, in a way. I've got kind of a couple of points to follow up on that. So one is, first of all, I didn't like in the way, because after you make a choice, essentially you can check your notebook afterward, and it's going to kind of like your main menu, your hub for everything you do in the game. 
um, and it tells you your personality ranking based on the choice you made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whether it's just or whether I, it's... I think it does right before you go into the next case, too. I yeah. think it actually pops up on the screen. Yeah, and it, it tells you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually wish that they wouldn't do that, and that they would tell you what your personality is at the end. Because then you're starting to be self-conscious about like all these decisions. It's like, oh, it's almost like uh, you know, in Mass Effect, you've got the Paragon or Renegade, or in Star Wars, you've got like the light side, the dark side, infamous. and it's got yeah, infamous. It's got the blue and it's got the red. And are you the blue side or are you the red side? It yeah. encourages binary thinking. Yeah, and what exactly. what encourages that as well is the fact that at the end you only have those two choices. Yeah, and so, so and I don't mind there being two choices, but I do mind that it's so. Um, Transparent about well, what it's doing. Two choices for each choice, though, and it's usually about six choices. No, no, but but what we mean is like once you've made a conclusion, you decide right. that this is the. What We're talking about the moral choice at the end. Yeah. I understand. Which which I do notice you did write more morality. You know, I did. Moral choice. Mm -hmm. So even you don't think he's amoral. Well, no, I, I meant the <laughs> aspect of morality. And then I wrote amoral and it Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. But um, well, that was a moral. I, well, let me ask you this. Like, well, let me <laughs> no, say it in a different way. Mm -hmm. well, we were talking about agency. Yes. And so, um, do you think that providing a an empty vessel of a character allows us to pour in ourselves into this Sherlock Holmes and take more ownership in Sherlock? I was actually just about to say that um, I think that I did pour myself into Sherlock Holmes quite uh -huh. a bit because I was, I was going to say that, and this is probably just because it's me playing it, but I didn't find that there was a very good job of making a lot of gray area in all these cases. I think the grayest one, the grayest decision was the train case, where it's, am I going to have the police fall hard on these guys now, or am I going to sort of play this political game? Mm -hmm. Because then it's kind of like, the okay, well, get away. Yeah. So there's that, yeah. Well, there, there, there's that element. And I agree. And I, I but it, it's, too, it's, it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's a tough decision. It's kind yeah. of like, which one do I want to go with? Whereas with all the other ones, it like pretty much just consistently was like, I see no reason to let this particular person get away with this. The last one was the oh, most... Wait, really? You, you threw the book at everyone? Pretty much, yeah. Really? Except, ex like, so I didn't go all the way blue, <laughs> again, because they were uh -huh. telling me. Yeah, yeah. I didn't go all the way blue because I did go with the political game on the second case, because I didn't want to cause an international So incident. you also See, threw the book at, at the first guy, too. Yeah, I did. Really? So I, I felt the opposite. I felt that most of them were, I was actually sympathetic with most people, except for that one woman in the plant, mm -hmm. the plant case, which was like, in case four, mm -hmm. mainly because it was extremely clear that she had orchestrated the entire freaking thing, yeah. and then the absolved choice was making her out to be a victim, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking, yeah. Uh, well, so Whereas, the, like, for example, the first premeditated guy, right. Yeah, it was premeditated, yeah. but but the harpooner guy, you know, you could totally see based on the evidence mm -hmm. and based on the story behind his relationship with, um, you know, the, the victim mm -hmm. that he could have. They, they were both there drinking. He could have tried to attack. Cause that's what it seemed like. He tried to attack him. And it was a self defense type mm -hmm. thing. So a lot of them, it, it came across as, and there's definitely an open to interpretation. Yeah, it is open to interpretation. So I, there, I, that was and, definitely there. And too. my interpretation was that it wasn't self-defense, it was more that he was after something. Oh, um, he was after something. Yeah. He went there to blackmail, mm -hmm. and we know that. Exactly. But we also know that there was a knife that was pulled out by mm -hmm. those five victims, so there's that element too. Mm -hmm. And if you pull a knife on someone, automatically you're sort of well, empowered. Of course, we don't know we don't know the order in which this happened. But then, this is going back to your point, Doc, where we're sort it's of... Hard to pull a knife out with the harpoon. Well, he could have grabbed the harpoon and he could have pulled out the knife, that sort of thing. So, like, he grabs the harpoon and he's getting throw and the guy tries to defend himself with the knife. But th this, is, this is getting distracted from the main point, which is that, you know, we are filling in our own interpretation on these events. Yeah. And actually, um, sort of as a side, what gave like when I knew that I was wrong the first time on that case, I went back and the thing that tipped me off because I actually um, did have one crash while I was playing. I had to redo that whole case. Mm. Um, so the second time through, I knew what I wanted to do, but I figured out that the clue that told me it was what it was and not what I thought it was at first um, was actually not a clue you see in the deduction space or the analyze. It was that I saw that there were two glasses that had been used for right. drinking, right. and therefore I knew that there was someone there with them, and therefore I knew that it was our It was contextual. Um, so it's something he that... He does point that out, too, I think, when you're... He, 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 he does point it out, but it's not something the game is sort of advertising as, hey, this is the giveaway clue. You there know? were actually a lot of, of little things like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. I, I, I know... Um, I got an achievement mm -hmm. from like all like explore like getting, basically finding everything, mm -hmm. clicking on everything, yeah. and, you know, because I wanted to find to examine everything. Mm -hmm. But not everything is relevant, right? But most of it was, and actually, I don't even know if I'd say that. I, I mean, I think everything was relevant up to a point because, for example, there's there's I know in that one estate case, you can examine a lot of little paintings in the wall, mm -hmm. and those give that gives you background information about who these people are and mm -hmm. who lives here. And, and you know about this guy's family, mm -hmm. and uh, you know about, you know his obsession with hunting and all that. Mm -hmm. So it just it gives you char character information, which um, getting back to the characters and one of the things that 
they do um, for all the characters, like the, the characters that are part of the case, you have that um, examination space, or what is that? What is that called? Is um, profile. Like profile. Yeah, yeah. Character profile. So, uh, which where you open up that whole scene and you're able to like, uh, it's 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 sort of the thing that, that Sherlock Holmes. One of the things that he's known most for is yeah. being able to look at parts, like little little subtle hints of character in everything about you, like the way that you're standing, the way that you're dressed. Um, you, know, you have a ring, therefore you're married. Yeah. You have uh, dirty clothes, therefore you're a gardener. You have yeah. yeah. The, pre- the presentation yes. reminds me of the BBC Sherlock again because it had the the text the pop text up on the detail. Yeah. Yeah. The, mar- right. the the marriage one, by the way, anno- would annoy me every time because I'm trying to use the Xbox controller with the analog stick to, uh-huh. to find it, and I'm like, and I know that's what it is. It's always almost every single one was there. Look, he's looking for a ring. Almost every single <laughs> time, but usually the, he also looks at the hands for different reasons, mm-hmm. you know, like calluses and stuff. Like that. I mean, it yeah. makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. I was trying to like see them myself, but unfortunately, I guess because I'm not playing on a, I guess the Xbox is not good enough to show. Most of the time, you could I couldn't see the wrinkles or the mm-hmm. most of the time. Um, it depended. Like some of them, I could, but when it was very obvious, like it was like red or cal- like super callous or something. But a lot of times, he put on and he'd go, "Oh yeah, these hands are, are wrinkled." Blah blah blah. Most of the time, um, I can actually see the, but I, the, the blurred text. I can actually see what it was. So I knew what I was looking for. Yeah, but I couldn't see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't see on the, um, for example, when you put it on the hands, I would get really annoyed because I knew it was on the hands that I had to click. But I'd already clicked on one thing on the hand, and I'm like moving around on every pixel on the hand trying to find where the heck it let me click. <laughs> yeah. And that is one thing about adventure games that I think is carried over. It's done well in Sherlock Holmes, but it's one thing that I do think is carried over from old school adventure games, which is a flaw in the adventure game genre, and that is when you know what to do, and you but you don't know how to do it yeah. with, the, with, the, with the interface. Right. And usually that didn't happen, but one time this did happen um, when I was in the, the plant case, which is my most hated case. I always go back to it. <laughs> that one did feel like um, it was too long for something. Yeah, but also um, I had this, had this moment where early on you're trying to examine the death of the Mont- Montague, or something like his name was, or Montague. And so um, you start out in the room where the plants, Mon- yeah, duck, Mon- or something. Yeah, there's a Mon- something. Montauk. Montauk. Thank you. Montauk. Yeah. Right. So you're supposed to. You know, it's close enough. So um, see, I don't remember names. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I literally just played this case yesterday night. Um, but yeah, so I'm in this room, and you start. You start in the room. You're supposed to be examining the um, the plants and the, the stolen plants and all that. So there's clearly blood on this little fountain area. I see the blood. First thing that I see, I notice personally me, um, not Sherlock, and I can't examine the blood. And I'm just I'm looking around. And I'm, I'm really trying because I've, at this point I've gone through. This is like this is the fourth, fourth or fifth case. Fifth case. It's the fifth case. Fifth case. Yeah, this is the fifth case. So I, I know by now I see blood. You, you got of course. Yeah. yeah, of course I have to examine the blood. Can't examine the blood. So um, it gets to a point where I'm supposed to be examining his death, and I go through and I use the Sherlock space. And I click on all the different things, and I'm seeing everything around me, you know, the broken pot, and the door busted in, and all that kind of stuff. I can't click on the blood. So I think, oh, well, I guess I'm not supposed to. So I continue on this case, and I find various threads. I find the stuff about the Divine Syndicate, all that. You know, I'm bringing in Toby. And I'm going pretty far in the case, and it comes to a point where I have done everything that I can do except for solve this one part where I'm supposed to examine his you know, murder scene. And that was because, for whatever reason, the game wouldn't let me click on the blood. So finally, I returned to this place after mm-hmm. looking online, trying to figure out what I did wrong, because people are like talking to me and they're supposed to be giving me more information. The <laughs> story's supposed to be continuing, it's not, so I think my game's a bug. I, and maybe this was a bug. And finally, I go back to this place, and I look around again, and now, all of a sudden, it lets me click on the wall. And I wasn't even close to it this time, by the way. I was like, not even close, and it was letting me click on it. So I'm, I think I kind of remember that. Really it, confused it didn't take me that long to see the blood, but I think there was a few No, but I saw it instantly. That's, that's uh, the no, no, I, I, what, what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, like, the, the game, like, before it lets you do it, um, and it, it gets to your same point, is that, like, for me, I did it much earlier than you did, but it was still kind of like one of these weird cases where it sort of has this fixed order of you have to do these things first, and then it will let you look at them. Yeah, it was kind of a narrative reason that you weren't able to click on it yet. But that doesn't make any sense. No. If you're if you're Sherlock Holmes and you see blood all over like a fountain, yeah. and you're constantly investigating murder cases, because you do, mm-hmm. you're going to look but at it. But it wasn't a murder case at that point yet. Yeah, but there's still blood all over a fountain, so right. rarely you're going to think, right. oh, this is a murder case, because there's a bunch of blood all over here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you should you would expect not to find blood. Not to mention that they let me examine the broken flower pot, the door that got busted in, mm-hmm. the Wisconsin that was busted. Mm-hmm. So you're seeing all these things that are leading to someone is like struggling so someone died and yet yeah. you don't 
you can't examine the blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's just one of those weird cases where it was a little bit too scripted. But overall, I think that compared to a lot of other adventure games, it was fairly open ended. You can do things whatever order you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And then there were other things up to that a point. I mean, up to a point. There's there's a lot of that. I'm not saying it was perfect. Then I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging that this case is one. I think which I think there was actually more gaming than it seemed like at first. Oh yeah, no, there's definitely gaming. It felt it felt very open, and as I was going through the game, mm -hmm. I started noticing the way that they would take things more. Mm -hmm. I think I think it was more good than it seemed. Mm -hmm. But I do agree with your point earlier, Doc, about it being not as linear as a lot of the other mm -hmm. um, right. adventure games. It is presented in a, in a format that allows you to explore the case in your own way, particularly in the way that you make deductions. Because mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to make those deductions that allow you to do a deeper investigation. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you, you can just come up to the first deduction if you think it's right, you do it, and then you just basically cut off two-thirds of the chapter. Because yeah. you came up to a, you came to a conclusion, you made your decision, and then you just moved on. So. Yeah. And you can, I think the fifth one, you can basically finish it almost instantly. I want to say. I remember in the fifth, and not the fifth, the sixth, I'm sorry. The the, last six. Yeah, the sixth one you can finish very quickly, um, like almost instantly. Yeah, I basically just agree that it's like, oh yeah, it must have been, must have been him. Or in the fourth one, you can get a very quick conclusion. And actually, the fourth one, um, the estate, was one that I actually um, thought was kind of a weird case because it sort of fell into this pattern of oftentimes the correct person to, the, the person who did the crime, the correct answer was the one you sort of find by finding all the clues and by doing the extra investigation and stuff like that. Like there was, no, I don't remember any time where you find an extra person, an extra figure involved in the case that actually wasn't the culprit. Um, so it became a little bit predictable in that way, or well, the, it's kind of an unfortunate pattern. It depends. I think it depends on the case. Like for example, in the final case, um, you find a bunch of different people that are towards the end of the circus, mm -hmm. and some of them are involved. Like one of them was involved in a way, mm -hmm. but technically what well, he wasn't really the one that like he didn't actually kill them, he sort of orchestrated an event that got them killed, but he may not have really meant for that to happen. Yeah, and that was then, that, yeah, there's an exception. There was three other people there that also really didn't have anything to do with the murder case. I mean they were doing their own thing, mm -hmm. you know, that but they didn't have anything to do with the murder yeah. case. Then you have the um, the train case where you've got a bunch of these different people involved and you kind of meet them in different orders and stuff. And mm -hmm. you can actually meet, for example, that one Mexican guy tends to be Cuban. Mm -hmm. um, you can meet him pretty early, or you can meet him later. It all kind of depends on which place you decide to investigate first. Yeah. Um, well, um, yeah. So I think there's a little more. The, 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 there, there is. There's right the, the, the sailor, the, the sailor case, which I think was the fourth case, the estate, the, the and estate then also the Harpooner, which was the first one, and both of them. They definitely have elements of that, yeah, where you're I, looking for this one particular person mm -hmm. and evidence I think those are I, I think, I think, I think my point is just like the times when you had to track down a new suspect, it was always the new suspect. Whereas with the other ones, like even even the thing with the um, the, the circus performer, you had to track him down and like basically the, the correct answer was that, you know, even if he didn't murder the guy directly or whatever, like you said, it was kind of this orchestrated thing, but he was still the culprit that you ended up condemning. Um, and so you ended up condemning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so speaking speaking of the story, because we're talking about all, like I guess we're kind of been going through the story and sort of by case by case basis. Kind of, yeah. Um, but there was kind of a, an overarching narrative element running through the story, and that was the the point with um, Mycroft and the Merry Men, mm -hmm. yes. and, and the, the story behind that, where you would get little you get little snippets of the story of Merry Men. Mm -hmm. um, so, Doc, what did you what did you sort of pick up on of the Merry Men? If you well, um, it's not going to be very merry. One of the things that I wondered as I was playing it is how much of it tied into the other Sherlock Holmes games that have come out, or even the, the stories, because mm -hmm. it seemed to fit into a very specific time in the Holmes narrative. Um, like even after the Moriarty stuff, um, when he had faked his death and, and then come back from it, and that kind of a thing. They reference old cases. They did. They, they really did. The Jack the Ripper came up a lot. It came yeah. Referencing that. Yeah, actually it did. Um, so I think this was like technically number seven, like the seventh Sherlock Holmes game that, um, what's it, what are they called? Frog? Frogware? Frogware, yeah. Has, has that. Frogwares. Frogwares. Yes, that's right. Um, so there's a lot of background stuff there, and, and the mechanics are very different. But um, to, to answer it, what, you know, what I like about that duality between Holmes and his brother is Holmes is freelance. He's sort of the, the private school, um, or maybe even the homeschool edition, versus uh, you know, the standardized testing of public school. 
if you will. That's a metaphor. Uh, <laughs> and and so what you've got is the establishment versus the guy who, you know, literally is using the word uh, absolve or convict. He's a one man trial and sentencing. Oh yeah. I mean, he's just like I'm. See, and and that's where I think. The, the whole the question of him being amoral kind of gets thrown out. Like Mycroft, I would say Mycroft is amoral. Mycroft is an amoral character because he has this. I'm I am I'm doing it with the letter of the law, and I'm doing what I think is going to best benefit my position. Mm-hmm. He, I would go so far. I would say that Mycroft is a sociopath. But wow. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, I love where you went. That, 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 that is, I think I think that's still moral though because it's, no, it's what, it's so, someone can. Morality. Well, the the idea that you're doing things in your own interest. I mean, that's not. That's a moral choice to basically, for exa- example, go against the letter of the law and be manipulative for your own gain. Or no, that's someone. not necessarily a moral choice at all, actually. That's but, not he's lawful neutral. Is what yeah, that's I think, not, I, think we're, I think we all have different <laughs> definitions of what morality is and what it means. But, well, it's like if you're doing, but without going into that too much. Yeah, but, if you're doing something only in your self-interest, mm-hmm. then that's not really like if you don't have it's it's it could it could technically be a moral choice if you have a sense of morality. But I'm saying I don't think that. He has any sense of morality. So immoral in your guys' sense, then it's just like yeah, you can go, you can go something, you can go something. Yeah, you can go. That's what more. Yeah, mm-hmm. you could go. You could basically be an immoral person in the sense that you understand that I'm doing this in my self interest, and you know that it's bad, mm-hmm. right? Like you were saying, mm-hmm. and then you would just be an immoral person. But I don't think he even has a sense of that. Mm-hmm. That's the impression that I've always gotten from my bro. Right. But with Holmes, I think that especially because he has this sense, I think that if anything, Holmes believes that he is morally, morally superior to everyone. That is the impression I've always gotten with, with Sherlock Holmes. Is that he believes that he is, he's like a moral authority, okay. and it's even it's even in, in, it's even um, um, enhanced by and that's the wrong word. Um, it's even reinforced by um, that that final choice at the end of each case, the absolver or, or convict. Holmes is saying, I'm going to make this choice. I'm going to say, am I going to turn him over to you know Scotland Yard, Scotland Yard? And uh, Lestrade is going to throw the book at them or give them the rope. That's the that's word used a lot. Give them the rope. Them the rope. Or it, am I going to say, well, you know, this was self defense, or um, this person, maybe they didn't, maybe, maybe they, should be, they should still be arrested, but they should, that Lestrade should go like, give them a lighter sentence and not actually have them executed, stuff like that. So he's making these, he's very openly making these decisions. These are, these are moral decisions that he's making. If it was up to my prop, he would just, he would. Go for not just convict every time, but he would just basically do what does the law say and what is going to be beneficial to my position and to you know the government that he serves, and that's all he's really going to care about. He's not really even considering the moral choice side of that. Yeah, yeah. At least that's the way I I interpret all of that. So do you, do you I, disagree? No, I don't necessarily disagree. I I'm still stuck between the uh, whether or not the character of Holmes is just deferred and left to the player. And I think I'm going to go with yes, because of the ending of the very last case. So a big spoiler alert. Uh, you basically have the, the choice to... Uh, oh, in what direction you go down? To, set an expl- or to allow an explosion mm-hmm. or not, and the explosion basically destroys the records. and It's, it's a terror attack. It actually, it's a terror attack. It reminded me of the end of... For uh, a good reason. Um, you can guess what, what side I went with. <laughs> yeah. Did you really? Oh, of course. I yeah. thought. I thought. I heard these guys. These guys. This, the, the idea, and I was like, I'm completely on board. Where do I sign? <laughs> That's interesting. And I thought, no, I thought, but yeah, they remind you in the Beaver Vendetta, right? Uh, no, actually, let's say Fight Club. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Tyler Durden. And it was almost identical to what happens in Beaver Vendetta. Yeah, like Fight Club is way destroy. cooler before uh, 9/11. By the way, just just saying, just throwing it out there. I still think Black Lives is really cool. Well, it's just the ending with the with the buildings coming down. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, they do that in, in Beaver, Beaver Dead. Yeah, they, they do. That's true, actually. That's a good point. Um, and, and that was written long before Black Lives. Period. It was? Yeah. It was it, a comic book. It was a comic book, oh, okay. was a comic book yeah, in, the, yeah. in the late so 80s. The story so. was that. That's a good yeah. point. That's a good point. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, it, it, was, it, it was one of those things where I actually clicked on the wrong thing. Because uh, he's smoking, right? He's yes. smoking a cigarette, and so you've got to decide where you're going to throw the cigarette. And I didn't understand the implication of the choice that I was making. It wasn't narratively uh, clear to me, mm-hmm. and so I just I just threw it in the bucket and, and moved on and, and watched the cutscene. And then the explosion happened, and then there's like Holmes with this maniacal kind of, "Yes, we all make choices." Ah! 
that, and I'm like, oh, no, that's not what I meant to happen. And so I reloaded the thing so that I could throw it over and destroy the explosion. I thought, explosives before they could be used. I didn't even think it sounded maniacal. I mean, I, it came across to me as he was making what he was making a choice. Like he basically was kind of saying at the end there that you know every every person gets to make their own choice, and he's letting them make their own decision. But he wasn't. He was. He could have stopped. He could have stopped them there, but I think that he um, he did have a a measure of um, sympathy for their cause. Well, yeah, I, and I he also could have informed the authorities. Yeah, but he, he's didn't. still fairly neutral, basically, even when he does cause the explosion in the circus before the terror attack can be carried out. He actually says, I think the line was like, um, I'm going to stop this attack, but I won't stop you. Run. And basically tells them to run yeah. and get out, and then he blows the thing up. Right. So, but he still lets the merry men go on their way, right. which is still kind of a... That's why my crop's upset with him at the end. It's like, oh, you could have you know, stopped them and you know, helped your country, but instead you let them go. It's like, well, yeah. I did stop the thing from getting blown up. So, mm-hmm. I mean, He does have a very clear sense yeah. of... That's what I, it kind of goes back to it. I do think that you know, that he would have considered that wrong to kill them there in that mm-hmm. situation. So I think that yeah. you know, it's there is that that sense where you know Mycroft would have been like, well, you know, what's going to be best for? But he warns government? his brother not to create ten merry men whenever he brings down one. Yeah. yeah, and that that to me was a much more powerful statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't get that. dramatic. <laughs> I sort of I, I no, like, you didn't because you did the immoral thing. <laughs> I like I like the amoral or immoral. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the statement that he made about um, the statement that he made about you know people having making their own decisions. And I actually was kind of won over by the the, the, the talk about freedom from the internet. Mm-hmm. So to me, I thought that kind of was was a little more relevant than today's climate in in terms of like the rising rising debt and, and well, the, sure. sort of the area of everyone. And maybe it's because I'm also in. in, in Tons of debt myself, so maybe that was part of it. But, <laughs> well, you're a student, but, but right. But I thought that, um, or, or was a student for quite a while. <laughs> right. But yeah, like it's it's one of those things where you know I, they do they sort of had a point with what they, with this concept of all of the um, you know the rising cost of debts and having to sort of like work um, work in order to pay off your debts and, and the, the system favors the, the rich system the system like the kind of like hurting them they were thinking well we'll do this to sort of balance things out mm-hmm. their whole idea also they were not it wasn't going to take it wasn't going to hurt anyone it wasn't going to like there was no real danger to any person like <laughs> yeah. actually being you know they're, 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 they're blowing, they're blowing the papers. up papers yeah. so ultimately you know in a sense it almost wasn't really that big of a deal anyway because they're just blowing up papers mm-hmm. I didn't really it's not like I'm sure they've got like duplicates. You know, so like people who have a claim on something. Also, I would disagree with the idea that, that that this would be a terrorist attack because the idea behind a terrorist attack is that you're trying to uh, frighten someone or into in, you're basically trying to, to enact political change through fear. And they weren't really trying to do that. They were just literally trying to destroy paper. No, they weren't. They were I, trying to destroy you, papers. You could argue they're trying to. They were trying to destroy records. And once the records were gone, then it was gonna like they weren't really trying to. Like, who were they trying to, to frighten? They were communists. Well, they're, yeah, they're trying they to show were anarchists actually. They're, they're, they're they trying. Anarchists. Yeah, anarchists. They I mean, were definitely anarchists. I mean, like you well, know, to an extent, but yeah, they're it, right. it depends on how how broadly or how narrowly you define terrorist attack. But um, well, this is the element of fear. But but the element of like showing that like, hey, if we don't get our way, we're still going to stick it to the government by blowing stuff up. But that, I think that's, that's, but I think that's you you get like sort of imparting your own personal uh, personal feelings of them onto them. Like I don't you can well, no, like, that to them. I don't think they actually were thinking that way. Like you have to be intentionally as a terrorist thinking I'm trying to and. I am trying to frighten them or frighten someone. That's kind of the point. You're I, terrorizing. I, I think that they were to an extent, but I mean, I will say that that speech did appeal to the libertarian in me. Yeah. Um, but then, <laughs> but the libertarian in me still also says, but you know, even though the system did create what it is, you know, the, you're destroying belongings of people who, you know, what the, they they were complicit in the system, like you know, to have like their holdings and stuff like that and their titles. They were complicit in the system, but not all of them were doing that with malice and all that sort of stuff. Chris so. is also lawful neutral. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it, it was it was an interesting choice. I did think that was one where uh, something's going on. Um, where there was a uh, an interesting kind of gray area in there in that final choice. Oh, there definitely was, and I think you could interpret that in multiple ways. And I'm not necessarily saying that that you know Mike was right. But it's just it to me it felt right and it felt like it made sense mm-hmm. in the moment. Yeah. And I do think that it was I think either choice could be would be something that Sherlock may have done. Yeah. So yeah. I think that and that's something that with the endings too that we sort of we sort of touched on as well. It's like both the absolve and conflict. There were reasons behind doing after one. Mm-hmm. And so you could justify that and I think that they both sort of fit in with, with Sherlock Holmes mm-hmm. and his character. Which was 
pretty well done in itself. Yeah. So it's a good way of kind of having the character come through while still letting the player have some agency and some choice yeah, and how they're sort of interpreting the character themselves. Well, we should probably talk about the voice acting. Yeah. Because it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I loved it. I felt um, it really it helped create that. We can talk about the, the atmosphere of the game all together because I know we're, we've been going for quite a while. Yeah, the, the but, um, but yeah, the setting, the atmosphere, the, the graphics, uh, but the sound, there's all of the soundscapes for, for all the locations were, were very well done and I felt that um, it did a good job of placing me in um, London in this time period, mm -hmm. in the late 1800s. Um, and the voice acting was incredible. I don't know if they, the rest of the games had the same voice actors, but I thought, um, I don't know, I don't know any of their names, unfortunately, but uh, Sherlock Holmes, the guy who played Sherlock Holmes, did a great job. I was like, that's my, that's now my Sherlock Holmes voice. Whenever <laughs> I you know, go back and reading the stories, I'm going to be reading them in that voice from now on because that actually was, was I thought did an excellent job. I thought Watson did a great job. I thought all of the the little characters because this game was fully voice acted, mm -hmm. and you know I'm someone that uh, I'm sure I've said it before. And I'll go on record mm -hmm. saying it again that I'm someone that does not like voice acting gener for, as a general rule in video games. I'm yeah. against voice acting because I feel that it limits narrative. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that especially for... It takes up resources that could have been spent expanding the game, having more choices. Right. It's more, it's more of a choice, not so much a money mm -hmm. issue, which there is that too, yeah. but also because you can't have um, a ton of different narrative options. For example, in a game like Planescape Tormund or you know, Baldur's Gate yeah. games. Mm -hmm. And then that's what I mean by that. Right. You can't have all these different narrative choices because if you're expecting everything to be 100% fully voice. Of course, this game was on a lot smaller scale, did a, good, or did a really good job with narrative, but the voice acting really did help this sort of presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you all think about voice acting? I agree that it was really good. Um, actually, something that you brought up to the environments and stuff like that, I think they were all very well done. Yeah. Um, there was a nice bit of like, you know, the it didn't need to be huge and expansive, but it still felt like you could sort of go to places. Like it, it, it was a while before you hit invisible walls, and usually you wouldn't hit invisible walls because um, uh, you know it sort of did. Like you didn't feel like you had to go that far. Um, but it would your map would just open. It wouldn't yeah. be an invisible wall. It would yeah. just open up your map. And that's what I meant by invisible wall. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I like that. But one of the things that did just slightly bug me is the fact that you have to go back and forth between locations so often. Yeah, and the case. loading times between that, yeah. them, at least for me. And that's why I want to play on PC or PS4. Like if you're now that it's not free on PlayStation Plus, if anyone's considering buying it after listening to this, um, you know, get it on a next gen console or on your PC. It's on PS4 as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Next gen, um, because. Um, it will probably go a lot quicker. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and like when you have to go like to analyze this thing back at Baker Street, you know, you, you don't feel like you have to be quite so efficient. It's like I need to do everything I need to do here and then everything I need to do at the next place because otherwise you have to go back and forth and it's just like loading, loading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was one small frustration. But overall, I thought the presentation was really good. Voice acting, the, um, the environments were all really nice. So. Um, the, the faces were done really well. Mm -hmm. Like I know that's something that some games have struggled with. Mm -hmm. um, for example, Elder Scrolls games, mm -hmm. including Skyrim, have they struggled with making faces that look that look real and good. Yeah. And I, I, would, I wouldn't say that was perfect, but it was better than it could have been. Um, and oh well, it's, I don't think we're at that level of yeah. perfection just yet. And uh, La Noire is one that like some people have argued is like, oh man, it just looks so good because they did the facial capture, but that was. It doesn't age well when you see it on like no, anything. Really yeah, anything today, you can tell that it's just a video pasted onto a face. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, as far as having actually like animated assets and stuff like that on the face, um, it did look pretty good overall. So, yeah, really good. Well, they also had sort of a floating head problem in L.A. Noir. They they pasted all the heads onto the bodies later mm -hmm. as well. They were in that big ring. Right. Right. So, right. It was kind of that. It's a little strange. You know what you're looking for. Yeah, well, that's what I meant with the uh, the face floating on uh -huh. the face because uh -huh. they they filmed the thing and then just projected it essentially. That's so. really the that didn't bother me nearly as much in Eleanor as the completely pointless driving. Mm. They had this GTA style beautiful 1947 mm. LA mm -hmm. that was completely useless. Yeah. yeah, like there was occasionally a little crime you could solve here and there, like yeah. a side a side little mission, but. Yeah, well, they, they the, built, the, they the, built open world. the open world game and then yeah. they didn't make they forgot to make the open world part. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. And so it and, was disappointing. And to contrast that, Sherlock Holmes is not open world. They have very specific sets that you can sometimes they even block off sets you've been to when it's no longer relevant to the case. Mm -hmm. Um but you know, it, it they're very short cases, you can tell them and to play out as cases. 
um, and it's kind of nice and compact in that way. So um, I think overall the presentation was quite good. And the details as well on the environment, I thought they did a good job with mm -hmm. things like little posters and like um, you know little graffiti or signs. Mm -hmm. You know, all that I thought was was handled well and sort of like helped you get into the space of London or when you're in the countryside. I had, and actually that's something that, that I would like to ask um, all of y'all as well is you know the cases. There, you know, what case did you did you like the best and what case did you? The one not we haven't like? talked about number three, um, which was called bloodbath. Oh yeah, yeah, in the in the, the, Roman in the baths. Roman baths. Oh, that was a great. We, one. we did touch on that briefly when you, we had was like you figure out who it was. We had all sorts to decide with how they how they which weapon right, was which true. weapon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was cool because you actually had to remake the weapon. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's like, can I make the weapon with the metal? Yes, I can. Can I make it with ice? Mm, maybe it was ice. If the if it stabbed in the eye with an ice pick and literally an ice <laughs> an ice weapon. Um, but what I really liked about that one actually was the last part of it where you were found in sort of the catacombs element and had to make your way around it. And, yeah. and you had to use your brain, I mean, genuinely use mm -hmm. your brain to do it. Um, it rather than, <laughs> well, no, it really wasn't. But, but you had to but figure, you had to think you had to figure it out. Yeah. I, I, I can see the appeal of that one, but yeah, I think it was the longest that, one. It dragged on for me. I didn't really? like that yeah. part. Um, I, I, I don't know, just the, the Indiana Jones feel of it in mm -hmm. a way. Uh, I can see the appeal. It didn't appeal to me. Indiana Homes, thank you. Indiana, Indiana, Indiana Homes. Homes. <laughs> yeah. I think actually my favorite case was the estate one. Um, I was a little bit disappointed at the end of that one because it was kind of like, you find the extra guy, he's the guy who did it and all that. But it, it started off being really cool, kind of like morally ambiguous because you didn't see um, that the story that they gave pretty much perfectly matched the description of these thieves in the newspaper. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's like, it, it, it became obvious very quickly that it was a story that they made up and then it kind of did, it didn't look like it was about to be like, okay, they set up this murder and how do I feel about, like, do I want to absolve them or do I want to punish them for it? And actually I was leaning towards absolve because of the, how horrible this guy was. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, eventually you find out what actually happened and it, like, it kind of, it took away from kind of this thing where, we know their story is fake. What is the real story, and how are we going to deal with it? I did it all. I did too. And that triggered a QTE where he tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. He did that when I was about to condemn him too. Oh really? Yeah. Did you yeah. save him, or did you let him? I saved him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I saved him too. Yeah, I tried to save him and failed, and then had to reload the thing so that I could. Yeah. Um. For me, I mean, y'all already know my case that I hated it with this case four. I mean, case five, the uh, plant case. I hated <laughs> that one. But um, the one that I, the one that I liked the most. Uh, I guess would also be the one with the, the, the Roman bath one, the blood bath. Mm -hmm. um, the train case would probably be number two, because I really like the, the, the background politics, and I, I love just going from dirty London, dirty London area, to just here in the open countryside. I mm -hmm. love the, the way they do, the juxtapose the two cases. Um, and I love the concept of that missing train, even though I guessed what it was immediately, mm -hmm. right. but that wasn't, that wasn't really the point. It was like what happened to them, and there were actually a few different ways you could go, especially since you never actually get to see the train, mm -hmm. so you could always kind of argue. Well, you never see the train, the criminals. Yeah. I mean, the passengers. You see nothing. You know, you know where they could be, but you're you never actually go into the water or go into the mine. So, yeah, I know. I mean, I still solved it correctly, mm -hmm. and I still got the right answer, and I still chose the right method and all that. But, but it did have that element of, you know, where's the body mm -hmm. sort of thing. Like right. You don't actually see. I did find it interesting that this game kind of suffered from, like, what I'm going to call for now Phoenix Wright Syndrome. Or even the cases that don't look like murders are murders. You just haven't found out the murder yet. Right. Um, every single case was a murder. It's like you know, in a way that makes it more. Um, it, it sort of adds intensity to the narrative. It adds urgency. It adds a sense of gravity. Um, but I would have, it would have been interesting to see at least one or two cases that really were not murders. You know? Some like little girl comes up and her her cat ran off and Sherlock has you to see, go actually, find the cat. That would be fun if there are like little mini cases you can solve, like <laughs> like like little yeah. like little side quests while you're doing the main case where just someone comes up to you with a question, you just have to really quickly like the two minute mystery, you hear their story and you kind of like come to a snap conclusion. That's actually something they do in the BBC Sherlock. Yeah. Where you know they kind of like mention these like little side cases as they're going through it. Oh yeah. Um, show like the montage of the little side cases that he's doing. Or, or even like and... even like they're just like talking to someone. Like someone just comes up briefly and just makes a conclusion about them and then they move on. You know. Mm -hmm. That that would have been really fun. I, think. I mean, I just get the impression that 
Sherlock just didn't have any time for that. So you know, <laughs> yeah. the girl comes out looking for a cat. Like, I don't have time for that. I gotta. There's probably a murder involved, or even even a cool theft or something like that. Or I, I would actually like that, to, like the girl to come up to ask about like she lost her cat, etc. <laughs> the moral and choice is: do you help the little girl enough? No, <laughs> I wouldn't go there. Of course, I help the girl. Come on, <laughs> no, um, my choice was going to be that, it, that somehow this would lead to a murder. Like somehow mm. it would lead. Like every, this, the idea would be that every, every the, case the, the, the cat is used as a murder weapon. Yeah, there's some sort of like. <laughs> Main like a beginning where you think, oh, this couldn't possibly lead to a murder, and it just does. <laughs> nice. The, the the someone was deathly allergic to cat, and so the cat was placed there very intentionally to kill someone. Yeah. <laughs> Which again, that that whole thing with the plants, I hated yeah. that. Like, oh, okay, this is what this is how she chose to kill someone. She triggers these plants in order to drop. It was just it was overly complicated. I yeah. Just, I, I really That's felt. That's how you kill someone. No, I just felt that it was very. It, it just came across as like unrealistic and. The other thing was, choice, it didn't make any sense. The other like, thing was, kind of, choice wasn't yeah. even to go light on her. It was just, it's true. oh yeah, uh, she was just a victim in all of this. Well, no, she came up with this ridiculously complicated <laughs> she, plan. Of course, it, it sounded like the absolve was more like she was kind of betrayed by this guy and therefore it was justified. Which is like How the, is that the justified? weakest, the yeah. weakest absolve. That was the weak. Like all the other ones, I felt you could you could go either way with it, and I actually would. I, would, I sort of beleaguered. I was like, ooh, man. Do. But yeah. this one, I was. How could you possibly let this woman go? The other thing I didn't like about that case to get an achievement. Is, ah. They kind of forced you to make a certain conclusion in order to then do the second half and trying to find the accomplice. That's true. Um, I wasn't convinced at that point that even was Martin Hamish. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to see, okay, who else could it have been, or could I sort of find out that there were two people on my own before it forced me into figuring out that it was him. Because like, I wasn't even convinced at the time. I was like, oh yeah, it was him. You're mm-hmm. right. And then it's like, oh, there was someone else. Like I, I knew there was someone else. You know, I don't, I don't have to be forced into figuring out if it was him. Mechanically, I know why they did it though, because yeah. they, they actually changed elements of the environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it was technically a new level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think they were trying to sort of have that element that you get inside certain mysteries where you know. They have that twist where you think it's one thing and then it's another. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it was handled very the well. The surprise wasn't. It was surprise. supposed to be the surprise of, oh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's this guy. Mm-hmm. Oh, but now he's dead. So who is it really? It mm-hmm. can't just be him because yeah. now he's dead. So I, just, I really don't think it was handled well. I think it also probably hurt it because, well, no, they have the estate case in fact. But getting the estate case for, mm-hmm. for, I mean, it was just it didn't really leave that much of an impression. It was a quick one too. Um, yeah, but it's just the I felt the, the, the bloodbath was so strong, and the estate case. I liked it. I, I enjoyed it, but I just thought it was a little bit forgettable. But then you had that the plant case, and I just did not like it. Mm-hmm. I thought the finish was strong. I liked the last case. I liked that element of um, there was a lot of you had to make a lot of deductions that opened up new areas. Mm-hmm. I think it had the most of that in any of the other cases too. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, I think it's about time for us to start winding things down. So, kind of just uh, final thoughts overall on the game. What you guys think? Would you recommend? There's this really great component about being able to wear different costumes. I wish that had been more way underutilized. Yeah, it wasn't utilized hardly at all. Uh, there was a really cool hat that I wanted to wear through the whole time because it was like the Sherlock hat, and they wouldn't let me. It was actually locked. Mm-hmm. So I was waiting for the moment where it became unlocked, and I never actually wore the hat. I don't know when it became unlocked. You wear the hat in the second case. That hat? Yeah. The Sherlock like hat? Yeah. Like he's talking about that hat. No, he's talking about. I probably he's probably talking about a different hat than you're thinking mm-hmm. of. Because there is I'm a specific hat that, that you hat wear in the in the train case. But the entire train case, you're wearing a completely different outfit because you're well, like that's you're in his traveling country. country. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, but yeah, towards the very end, I'm per- in uh, the last case where you have to go change into the bandit clothes. Yeah. Um, you're, it seems like everything was open at that point. Well, yeah, there was, wrong about that. And there's, there's actually it wasn't right and it wasn't wrong. Wrong. Yeah. They were open, but but there's right and wrong uh, choices. Mm-hmm. You're you're supposed to choose the thing that makes you look like it. That's true. Yeah, you can't you um, can't just pick any. I just wanted to I just wanted to wear the Sherlock hat because it's Sherlock, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't let me. And so that was that was frustrating. There, there's a funny moment when I came out in my disguise with the bandit outfit, where literally the only thing I had to was just like this little curly mustache, <laughs> and it was totally obvious it was still Sherlock, which is I was even like my brother was watching as I was doing that part, and I was joking to him. It's like, oh yeah, I'm totally not the same guy. He was here a minute ago asking about whether I can get into this. And Watson is like, How did you get in here? Indeed. What have you done with Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> it's like, Oh, calm down, Watson. It's me. It's like, I never get used to your disguise at home. He's like, Yeah, not me why, because I literally just put on a mustache. Like, you get the impression that Watson is just sort of sort of like humoring how he's yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I like the interpretation better. I'll just, I'll, that's my answer. Yeah. Like Sherlock Holmes is actually just a, just a mental case. And like Watson is a psychiatrist, and he's just humoring him the entire time. Yeah, yeah. Like, we, we, we need his mind to solve these cases, so we'll humor him. And then I'm Actually solving any case, it's just like they just kind of like traveling along with like his band. Well, then, then that, that got really dark. Yeah, that got really dark. Yeah. 
um, but but yeah, that and, and the ability to kind of wear the clothes that, that mm-hmm. I wanted to that that's sort of, that that's what I would adjust uh, for eight mm-hmm. you know, whenever the next one comes up. Yeah, for me, I didn't honestly, I didn't care. I mean, at, at first, I was wanting to play around with the, the makeup and the and the clothing. In fact, one of the very first things I did was I explored this whole uh, place at Baker Street and I mm-hmm. found that. Mm-hmm. But you know, after after playing with it for a little bit and finding a lot of them locked. I went back to first person mode and I kind of thought, I don't really care what I'm wearing because I, I can project wherever I want. I'm not really seeing any else. True. Sean Combs is wearing what I, what I can show up on this morning. So I didn't really care about those choices as much. Um, for me, it's, it's definitely going to be loading times. Mm-hmm. I mean, I couldn't stand the loading times, honestly, but I think that's to me that is probably a lot better in the next gen and the PC games, uh, PC version. Um, but in terms of like the mechanics, things that I would like to see changed, um, at the very end, I really do think that we should have more of choices. Mm-hmm. And we all don't agree, but no, I just I, felt I, it's... More, a, more choices is always better. It's a little too binary Without to have... infinite shelf. Maybe it could be... Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking maybe you could do something like... Because um, sometimes your absolve was you're completely letting them go for whatever reason. And mm-hmm. it always made sense. And sometimes your absolve was give them a lighter sentence. Mm-hmm. And maybe you could do that. Maybe you could have... You know, there's a, there's a justification for letting them go. There's a give them a lighter sentence, and then there's a throw the book at them, execute them. Mm-hmm. So it's at least then you would have three, and it yeah. wouldn't be so. You're either, they're either going to die, they're going to be dead, or they're going to be completely stop free. And that was the choice in most of those cases, except for the very last one, I think. And of course, the training was totally different. Sense, yeah. But yeah, the very last one, your choices were lighter sentence or he, he dies. But the rest of them were you just let them go, and you'd never even reveal it to the straw, mm-hmm. and they just go free. Or they get executed. So it's kind of two very yeah. extreme choices, yeah. and which might have seemed less extreme in its period. Um, it might seem extreme to us now when we're kind of like we have this debate over capital punishment and stuff well, like that. Well, I don't have a problem with capital punishment. That wasn't the issue. The issue was they're two totally different things. You're either they're either yeah, arrested it was, it was and executed, binary. or they're completely free, and mm-hmm. no one even it's like, it's, like just, it's like well, I think too that that might be reflecting the themes of you know crime and punishment again, which is like you know justice in one sense is like lawful, you know. So the law says this is what should happen, and therefore I'm going to do what the law says. Mm-hmm. So it might might even be so much: are you just? It is. Do you play things by the book versus do you not play things by? And the that's book. definitely my cross. My my cross was that character. Mm-hmm. He was the. Always play things by the book, no matter what, no matter to what end. And he, um, I did get that thing at the end when he comes and he talks to you and he does the whole thing. He does yeah. quotes from um, Punch and yeah. Um But yeah, so Chris, what would, what would you change? Um, this next one? So if I could change some things, I think that they have a really good basis for um, like these new interesting systems of production and the open endedness of it. Mm-hmm. I would play around more with like kind of the way the cases go. I would make it so that each case kind of has a unique feel to it, so that you don't have those weird patterns like I was noticing where it's the last guy who's always the guilty one, that sort of thing. Um, as much as possible, try to make every case. If you are going to have just a limited number of cases and a very, a very little number of cases, make them as unique as possible. Um, but other than that, I really like the direction they were going with some of these new systems, like the deduction and the conclusions, and um, to an extent the moral choices, although, and make that more opaque and less transparent. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely worth trying out for anyone who's interested in you know playing mystery games, interested in um, a really cool Sherlock Holmes game adaptation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard of these before, but I've never been interested until now. Yeah. And I think one thing we should mention, because we didn't talk much about the mini games. I don't know if it's really worth going into all of them. We can touch on it. Is, it, is, it is worth noting that there are a lot of different little um, interactions and puzzles to solve. So and, and you can skip them if you don't. Right. And skippable. that's one of the coolest things is that they are skippable. So, you know, when I ran into the lock picking stuff, um, I actually was able to sort of solve them very quickly. But for some people, they might struggle because of, because sometimes it comes across a little, a little abstract. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you, if you take a little too long to solve it, you can just skip it. Mm-hmm. And it's like that for a lot of the puzzles. There's like an arm wrestling thing. The first one. There's mm-hmm. very different ones. I don't think you ever use arm wrestling again. No. no there's yeah. you can struggle with certain with certain characters. Like there's like actually a little bit of like fighting mm-hmm. in a sense in certain mm-hmm. areas where you're struggling to prevent someone from committing suicide. It's, like QTE stuff, yeah. it's it's QT, but there's but there's um you know sometimes it's you're trying to move your controller to a certain place. Sometimes it's like for example in the um, arm wrestling, it's QTE, but it's also you're watching spatial expressions mm-hmm. to see when you're supposed there's, to. There's a bit of a puzzle. Well, there's, there's a puzzle, puzzle. I mean, if you just try to, like I did when, when I started, just try to mash the buttons, it doesn't work. You have to watch the guy's face and see 
you know, is, is, is this the point where I should hold steady? Is this the point where I should rest? Or is this when I should, you know, go for the push? Mm-hmm. And so they, they have that element. There was that, like, the rock climbing, too. There's right. these elements of you have to kind of balance it, which I hated the rock climbing, by the way. I skipped that. Did you? Yeah. And that's certain. And I didn't really feel like I really missed anything when I did. I mean, yeah. I like some of the puzzles I like, but I think that it's, that it's good. The traps, I love setting up the traps in the, in the final case. So yeah, that was fantastic. Without the little mini games. And you only need that there. So there is that unique element yeah. to it. And I, I think, I think what I meant by uniqueness is the, because they did do a good job of diversifying the cases, having you do different <laughs> things and different stuff. I think what I meant is more. Um, the structure and yeah. the way, like mm-hmm. the way the gating works, the way the conclusions can be drawn. And some of the narrative. I, I would, I would love for the web to be utilized in completely different ways every time you play. Through. Yeah, that's, and maybe there's not a murder. little procedural, yeah. <laughs> there's not a murder. procedural generation of elements. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, to an extent, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Although that's always tricky. It's very, tricky yeah. <laughs> very tricky. Yeah. Go go. Very tricky. Yeah, I think it was a good game overall. I definitely recommend people give it a shot. Yeah. No. That was a slight review. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> it's a I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a recap of our experience. Okay. Where it's a, it's ten out of ten. It's nine out of ten. It's, it's five stars out of four. I give it I give it five Sherlock hats. Yeah. <laughs> and they give it two toes up. There you go. Two toes up. Which is what happens when you die and are murdered. And Sherlock Holmes has to figure out who it was. Yeah, I did notice that one case where. Um, early on, you're not supposed to you get a whole bunch of crap for trying to do an trying to do an autopsy, and then in the later case, you just walk right in and just do an autopsy yeah. right there, and right. no one no one questions you, no one says, "Hey, well, Sherlock, you're not supposed to." Do this. <laughs> Watson was doing the autopsy. Yeah, but the first time you weren't supposed to be in there, and the next time it's sort of oh, oh yeah, sure. you learn how to file paperwork. Oh, one thing I did want to actually ask: Did y'all did y'all notice um, in the very last case when you have to go to the pawn shop mm-hmm. and uh, you run into or at least I did, uh, Peter Kang, it's the guy that you um, that you exonerated in the first one, or that you could absolve in the first one, the mm-hmm. harpooner. I didn't absolve him, you, actually. Right, you probably didn't see him. I, I did see him. You did see him. I wasn't positive it was him. I was wondering if it was maybe just a recycled asset. It's like, that looks a lot like no, so it, I, I stood there and looked at that. He was wearing, he had the same face, yeah. he had the same outfit. If you turn around, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's the exact same bar that you meet in. Mm. It's just the door oh, closed. Really? Did you notice that? Yeah, no, it's the exact same bar. I looked in the window. Mm. It's the same bar. They we use the same space mm. in the first case. I'm I'm very curious if it is supposed to be the same guy or if that was just a recycled asset. Because it was it was Easter egg. He yeah. was he was smoking. Mm. He had the same like. Look oh, no, I, I definitely saw him. It's like, that, is that the same guy? And that's why I was a little bit confused because I did condemn See, the guy. So maybe I, he just got away. I don't know. I would think that it, would, that it wasn't him, in, except for when I turned around and I started looking at the space, and there was the same exact bar. But you know what? This does play into your um, your theory about Sherlock Holmes is just a mental case, and they're just sort of letting him solve. <laughs> there, you <go. laughs> there you go. He never actually punched the people you condemn. He was just, you know, so there you go. We just confirmed Jim's theory. That was actually, uh, <laughs> they, they peppered little hints like that throughout the entire game. There you go. <laughs> uh, so we'd like to remind you guys that as always you can listen to the Backward Compatible podcast anytime, anywhere and any way you like subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud iTunes, Stitcher or YouTube then join the discussion I like it when he does that Yeah. <laughs> it's always fun <laughs> you, think, you think he let us do it one of these times? maybe okay yeah, my brother actually asks every now and then if he can do it. It's like, nope. <laughs> I don't know if I have the range. So. I just expect you to bust through walls at some point. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give us a, a, a big frosty glass of Kool-Aid. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, um, I think it's about time for us to start wrapping things up. So I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Doc. And we'll see you guys next time. Hey. Okay. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us if you've ever played a Sherlock Holmes game, and what you think of it. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.